أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Welcome everyone to another wonderful session inshallah This is going to be a long one This is going to be a complex one And I'm so looking forward to this Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of topics that we're going to cover. And to be honest with you, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only to help us uh, keep it simple as much as possible and keep it uh, yusran, you know, easy for us to recognize and understand. Uh, we have to cover a lot of material today. So we're going to go directly to the, to the uh, beginning of the notes. And I will... Um, I will get started before uh, before you guys, um, you know, start wondering what's the topic and so on. The topic, alhamdulillah, is a continuation of the story of Suleiman. Slightly different than what I had planned, and that's just the way things go with this ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding us, and sometimes we go in the directions that we did not anticipate, but that's just the way it is. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up a huge floodgate of information because of this concept of understanding the story of Suleiman. I would uh, I would like all of you to please focus as much as possible on the presentation, inshallah. I promise you this is really heavy. Um, yeah, in the past I've said that YouTube live sessions will be light. Mm, ain't gonna work this time. This is definitely heavy. Fair warning, uh, make sure you're awake, make sure you're aware of all the details, take notes, and inshallah, you'll get a chance to, uh, you will get a chance to watch it again in the future and probably again and again. So we're going to focus on the Quranic concept of Siyam. It's something that you did not see coming. I promise you not a single person talked about this before. This is a concept that when you see it, you're going to say, wow, how did we miss this? And you're going you're gonna to see for yourself. We're going to talk about taraweeh of all things. We're going to talk about fasting, of course, fasting during Ramadan. All of those topics are going to be covered. We have a lot to cover. So first, I'm going to give you, just to relieve you, just to kind of allow you to feel a sense of uh, relief, a brief summary and the conclusions. All the conclusions will be there, uh, especially for those in a hurry. Hopefully you will you will uh, get what you want. But don't jump ahead in terms of the evidence. The evidence will be presented carefully, diligently, deliberately. And we're going to uh, probably continue with this topic in future sessions, sometimes uh, in the future. Before I get into the detail, I need to cover some foundational concepts. And we're going to do that next. And then we're going to cover the 10 ayat that are relevant from Surah Al-Baqarah, starting with 178, ayah 178. Dr. Hani, 178 is talking about something totally different. You'll see. You'll see. Once we understand this ayat and the, and the stage is set for us to understand the context, you're going uh, you're gonna to be amazed. You're going to be like, how come no one saw this before? And alhamdulillah, we're able to see it now and that's what really matters. And then finally, I'm going to give you my decision for myself and for my family and my advice for you. Again, this is covered in the conclusion and the brief summary, which I'm going to put right up front so you don't keep waiting. But I hope, I really sincerely hope that you keep staying with us and you stay with us all the way to the end. You watch the full video. Yes, it's going to be long until you really appreciate the depth of analysis and the beauty of the concepts that are covered um, in, in this ayat that we're going to talk about. Very good. This presentation is directly related to uh, the story of Suleiman, connected to the story of Suleiman. So please keep watching to find out more. Th this is going to be intriguing. I know we're not going to be able to cover it in the first 15 minutes or even half an hour, but you will see it as we keep fleshing out the details, you're going to understand, oh my God, this is directly related to the story of Suleiman. And you will learn, you will learn how you may be helpful. Please pay attention. You may be helpful to your ancestors who are undergoing the concept of Hisab and desperately need your help, desperately need your help today. This is something you can do, something you, you know can follow up with with a practical 
application that you can apply today. I promise you. So inshallah, you'll stay with us and you will uh, benefit from that. And uh, a, a surprising announcement maybe for some of you. During Ramadan, I'm planning for a new series titled Isa Ibn Maryam 2.0. Isa Ibn Maryam 2.0. New insights into the story of Isa Ibn Maryam. Again, these are some of the beauties and the, 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 the beautiful uh, nuggets and the wellsprings that have resulted from exploring the story of Suleiman and the surprises keep on going, keep on coming, alhamdulillah. So this is for this Ramadan, this coming Ramadan, starting in about two weeks, inshallah. I'm not sure it'll be daily, probably not daily, but we're going to have a series for sure, maybe 10 to 15 segments during Ramadan titled EIM 2.0, Isa ibn Maryam 2.0, amazing new disclosures, amazing new information, reinforcing a lot of the old conclusions, but a lot more. It turns out to be a lot worse than we thought, and you're going to see. And the evidence that we will uh, have access to because of the story of Suleiman, because of all the analysis that resulted from the proper understanding of the story of Suleiman, Alhamdulillah, you will see that we'll un unlock all sorts of other stories too. So this was an announcement. I would urge all of you, brothers and sisters, if you could, please subscribe to this channel if you have not done already, already done so. And after, after the end of this segment, if you would be so kind to put a comment, give us your opinion. We care about your opinion. So please give us your opinion. If you have any questions that I don't get to today, please give us uh, those questions in the comment below the video after it finishes. So if you're watching this as a repeat, then go ahead and do the comment now, or uh, don't forget to subscribe and like, and I would really appreciate that. Also, if you have not subscribed to our website, www.marvelousquran.org, please do so. It is to your benefit, to your advantage, and you get to support this project for the long term, alhamdulillah. So a few reminders, this presentation is very complex. There's no easy way to present it. I really struggled uh, to put this together, but alhamdulillah, we'll see if it works. You, you tell me in the comments if the presentation worked for you. It relies on prior concepts in this series, yes, but it also relies on new concepts that I'm going to share with you for the first time in this segment. Forget everything you were taught, please. These ayat are not saying what they to told us they're saying. And you will see for yourself the inconsistencies and the conflicts in the translations and the tafsir. Tons of amazing, you know, discrepancies in their explanations and their, uh, you know, tafsir and translations. And we're going to see some of them today. So definitely their translation, their interpretation are wrong. And we're going to see and prove it. Based on the context alone, we're going to understand major, major, ama you know, amazingly uh, new types of discoveries and concepts. The Quranic story about Sulaiman in Surah 27 really opened up many gushing wellsprings that we will continue to discuss in upcoming videos. Today's presentation is not the end on this topic of CM. I promise you, we're going to talk a lot more about this. Additional evidence will be presented, additional evidence beyond what, what I'll be able to cover today because the, the time is limited and there's a lot more evidence. And the things will become clearer and more convincing in the future segments. I remind you, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, perhaps, you know, this is not really a good segment to start with uh, because we refer to things like nested interpretation, Abrahamic locution, tafsil, divarication. We use the organic Quranic methodology. If any of those terms you're not really familiar with, then this segment is going to be very frustrating for you. So I encourage you to watch the rest of this series. Start with YT170 or even before YT46 or even before YT01. Really, this, is, this channel is like a course. It builds on itself one segment at a time until, alhamdulillah, we keep uh, re revealing or sharing with you new uh, disclosures from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are the results of this ilm. So if that's the case, please watch the other videos and definitely watch YT93. I would like those of you on the chat to give me some sort of a, a confirmation, uh, maybe three stars or something like that. 
uh, if the video and the audio is uh, are working well for you. Very well. Let's get into the brief summary and the results. As I promised you, I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna jump into the the conclusions, so to speak. The, the, you know, if you don't want to watch the rest of the segment <clears throat> and the rest of this presentation, these seven points will probably suffice. But I promise you, you'll be you'll be um, missing a lot. So we'll uh, we'll do what we can. Um, let's start. Number one, there is the difference between emphus and nufus. I mentioned this in YT171 and YT172. Emphus refers to the normal cells in this life and also the emphus that are uh, of the people who are in Al Firdaus and even Jahim. Nufus is a special category. We're going to see a lot more about this. Nufus are a group of people who are held in suspension. Think of them as pending final decision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're, they're dead. It's, it's their afterlife. So we're going to see that in detail uh, that these people, these nufus, are awaiting their rehabilitation. The word for rehabilitation or restoration is qiyamah. So what's going on with these people? Let me explain it in just a few seconds. So this is after their physical death, they go through the concept of qiyamah, restoration. Remember the basis, the Ummul Kitab for this term, aqamahu, is from Surah Al-Kahf. Uh, they found a wall that's about to fall down and he restored it. Aqamahu, the same term, the same verb. This is Ummul Kitab for us. This is part of dhikr, of course. And qiyama is to restore, to fix something that's broken. It's not necessarily damage beyond repair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would like to give such people a second chance. But this second chance is in a period of time called al-hisab. This is the other surprise. The concept of al-hisab is not the act of accounting, the act of accounting itself, like the accounting. No, it's not. It is a long period, a long duration. Using such duration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give a chance to those nufus to go through a rehabilitation and to prove their competency before they pass on to Al Firdaus. I hope this makes sense. So, there are some people who die and go directly to Al Firdaus, and there are some people who die and they go directly to uh, Hijr, as we've talked about this before. We're going to summarize all of this, by the way. And there are some people who go as Nufus into this suspension state, and we're going to see what it's called. And that suspended state, that suspended state, they have to go through a rehabilitation and they have to go through al-hisab, and they have to prove their competency before passing on to the next stage. So think of it as like a baby in the womb. We've talked about this as early as uh, the first few segments on this channel. Our presence in this life is like the preparation for the next life. And the same thing, There's a, there are some people who need incubation, who need, you know, some period because they are born not mature enough for al firdaus or they, they die not mature enough for al firdaus The same concept. I'm approximating, of course. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using that metaphor of the womb throughout the Quran with the concept of Rahman, Rahman. We've talked about this when we talked about the interpretation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Refer back to that segment. The same thing, even after death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides some rahmah to some people who don't deserve al-hijr, the quarantine, and they don't deserve or they're not ready to enter al-firdaus. So there's a period of rehabilitation. That period is called al-hisab. The conclusion or the sort of the objective of that period is qiyama, Or, la samahallah, they go downward toward Jahim or toward Al-Hijr. This is the story that we're going to continue from Surah, from the story of Sulaiman. So what happened to that woman? We're going to find out. What happened to Sulaiman? We're going to find out. Those people are in suspension. So, or were in suspension at the time the Quran was revealed. So these nufus include, pay attention to the word include. This is not exclusive. It's not exclusively this way. 
they inc this the, the term nufus include people who believe in Allah but did not seek epistemic monotheism. What does that mean, Dr. Haney? That means they're not really familiar with the concept of the Abrahamic locution, to summarize it in a very brief way. The terminology they use in their dua, in their salat, in their uh, connection to Allah are not the terminology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose in the Quran. Let me repeat it. The terminology these nufus chose during their life is not the same terminology that Allah chose for us to do salat and dua and dhikr. I hope it's really clear. And it makes perfect sense. So Allah gave us the Quran and told us to use it and told us how to use it with the methodology, the organic Quranic methodology that we keep using. We have been using, alhamdulillah, for four years. Allah taught us all of these things and gave us the warnings, gave us the help, gave us the malaika to come and support us and gave us the advanced knowledge about the afterlife model. And despite all of this, some people insist on rejecting all of this, and they want to make up their own way of communicating with Allah. So those people are falling into something called epistemic shirk. In other words, they did not seek epistemic monotheism. The source for epistemology is Allah. The source of all knowledge is Allah. Therefore, if you internalize this, you're safe, inshallah. But those who fall into that type of shirk, epistemic shirk, are included in this state of suspension after their death. So they believe in Allah, yeah. And Allah knows what's in their heart, yes. But they did not do what Allah asked them. Something very simple. Use my words to do shukur and to do dua and to do your salat, to seek your salat and so on and so forth. So we're going to get into the details about the Quranic after mo afterlife model below, and that will explain it a little bit more. These nufus include people who believe in this and this, etc. Ayat, uh, this is point number three. Ayat 2, 183 to 187 are addressing those who believed. But are clearly indicating a shift to a new Quranic system. We're going to see this. So yes, the ayat start with Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu. Many of you asked me this question before. Dr. Hani, many ayat talk about Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu. Um, but in these ayat, 183 to 187, there is a clear shift and we're going to see it. So Allah is encouraging Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu to shift. And therefore, these ayat are not to be dismissed. We can't dismiss them. We have to understand where do they fit in that transition and we've talked about the same transition uh, when we talked about Muhammad being a Nabi, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our beloved, being a Nabi to Bani Israel, not, not to the followers of the Quran. And then there was a shift for everyone to follow the Rasul, that is Muhammad, the one who brought us, who brought us the, the Quran. So therefore, after his death, no longer do we have a living Rasul, we have a living Quran that is the Rasul. So the Rasul becomes the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of providing us the same type of revelations and the same type of you know, disclosures, not new text, not new scripture, but the understanding based on that scripture. So we talked about this. This is a transition. This is a different way of thinking compared to how the Torah system was based on just one Nabi after another, after another. Muhammad was the last Nabi. Not for us, for them. And we've talked about that transition. The same thing, there's a transition. We're going to see it. Number four. The month of Ramadan is probably different than its linguistic etymology would indicate. Now, let me, let me focus on this a little bit uh, because I know some of you are going to drop off. The word Ramadan is an Arabic word and it's from Ramadan. Ramada. Ramada in Arabic, the root means to have uh, a time period where it's really hot and dry and, uh, you know, suffering thirst. So that's a Ramad, a Ramad, very, very difficult period of drought, uh, dryness, hot uh, weather, uh, that, that type of understanding. So that's Ramad. Ramadan is a word that relates to that. So we cannot dismiss. This is very important. Please take this with you if you check out early. We cannot dismiss the linguistic basis for a term used in the Quran. We cannot just make up our own term. 
So when we talk about the metaphorical representations of certain key words, we're not, we're not dismissing the linguistic basis. Linguistic basis has to be in line with whatever metaphorical representation. So if someone wants to convince us that there is no physical fasting and Ramadan is just you know, a weird name that Allah chose, well, you have to relate it. You have to relate it to the linguistic etymology of the Arabic word Ramadan. Now, this is for my traditional brothers and sisters. The word Ramadan has the linguistic etymology. We agree. But historically, it fell during a period of time where such hot, dry season and drought-ridden season would have happened during the time of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi That's likely the end of the summer, early uh, fall, early to mid-fall, before the rainy season starts. That's very logical and natural. Most countries around the world have that type of season, but it's not for every country around the world. So therefore, we cannot say Ramadan, which applied in Arabia in the 7th century, should apply to every part of the world. That's the first problem. The second problem is these periods, these, depending on the geographies, the period changes around the year. The third problem is that there is a very high likelihood that the Arabs or some of the Muslim states change the Hijri calendar. Because today, you know, in 15 days, we're going to be enjoying Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, and it's nowhere near. It's nowhere near the, the drought season and the season of thirst and so on and so forth that the linguistic etymology indicates. So clearly something has changed and it's not, it's not linked with the actual seasons. So I hope you understand. We have a problem with this. So all I'm saying is we have a problem with that word. Don't dismiss that problem. Because if you decide to turn a blind eye to that problem, your children won't. Your grandchildren will definitely won't. This is an issue that's out there. People have been discussing it. We need to deal with it. We're going to talk about this a little bit more, inshallah, soon, in this segment. Number five, this is very important. I cannot, as of yet, find clear definitive evidence regarding the obligation of fasting. Pay attention. The obligation of fasting from food and drink and sex upon every Muslim. Underline this word. Let me repeat it again. I cannot find clear definitive evidence regarding the obligation upon every Muslim, everyone. I cannot find evidence regarding everyone. But there is evidence that it was an obligation for Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions. We're going to see this. And there is also evidence that fasting is an obligation for some muttaqun, some of the disciplined ones, some of the people who are toiling, advanced toiling. It becomes an obligation in exchange or sort of in recognition, in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the beautiful ilm that he's sharing with us and for many other reasons we're going to see toward the very end of this presentation. This is my choice. This is the choice I'm making. So despite all of the above, which I said, I cannot find clear evidence, definitive evidence regarding everybody else. For me, there is evidence. I'm choosing and I'm also advising to remain observant of the fasting of Ramadan as it is currently practiced in the tradition. Even if the timing is not wrong, you're going to see. Uh, sorry, even if the timing is wrong, you're going to see that's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily that does not invalidate the concept of fasting. So being part of the ummah for this important devotional practice is highly encouraged. And you all know that we should not just stand out for the sake of standing out. If we can find a way to perform a certain devotional act in line with the rest of 99% of the ummah, so be it. So as it is currently practiced, it's not wrong. It's not perfect, but it's not wrong. And I'm choosing and advising to remain observant of the fasting of Ramadan as it is. Again, don't judge me yet. Don't criticize me yet. Those of you who are shutting off and moving away, 
Tom P, you have to watch the rest of this presentation to see my rational thinking regarding this, my reasoning. Otherwise, don't judge my evidence. So don't dismiss this until you first watch the rest of this presentation. Then you decide. Of course, you decide. But give yourself. Don't shut down the door. Give yourself the chance to understand the evidence, to understand the reality of what research of two years have yielded in this presentation. So this presentation is the result of over two years of research. So inshallah, you will find that it's useful to you too. Finally, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not institute nor approve of the so-called taraweeh, taraweeh, the night prayers during Ramadan, specifically during Ramadan. Pay, pay attention. I'm talking about during Ramadan. This type of night prayer that is very famous across the whole uh, Islamic ummah. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not approve of it, did not initiate it and did not approve of it. So the story goes, he, he even in the tradition, he, he did a night prayer during Ramadan uh, by himself. Maybe one person followed him, uh, you know, outside in the masjid at night by himself standing. Imagine the, the, the ummah, right? Imagine the community, Muhammad standing by himself, maybe one person standing with him and doing the night prayer. Where's the rest of the ummah? Okay. The next day he did the same thing. Few more people joined and prayed behind him. The third day, he did not come out for night prayer during Ramadan. And they asked, me, they asked him, and he said, I did not want this to become an imposition upon my ummah. That's what the story goes. When did Taraweeh become sort of a common practice? The answer is during the middle, middle of the caliphate of Omar, meaning the second caliph. So somewhere around maybe eight to ten years after the death of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Omar encouraged it. We're going to see the narrations. We're going to see some of the details. Regardless, this concept of Taraweeh, despite all of the stuff and the facts that I just shared with you, the concept of Taraweeh, not just during the month of Ramadan, underline this one, not just during the month of Ramadan, is a legitimate, highly recommended devotional practice for the believers. In its current form, no. And this is what we're going to talk about. It's not correct in the right form as the Quran would probably encourage it. And that's why Muhammad وسلم, never encouraged that. So is there the concept of taraweeh? Yes, it is. It's from the Quran. We're going to see it. And the form is different. The form is actually a little harder. And you're going to see for yourself. Furthermore, taraweeh, which is qiyamul layl during the month of Ramadan, is obligatory for the muttaqun. Again, not in its current form. This is really important. Not in its current form. It's not obligatory in this form, the way it is done traditionally. I know I'm saying a lot of different things in here, but this is the summary. Hopefully, for those of you who want to bail out early, you will take these takeaways with you. So it is, it's for advanced toilers, advanced muttaqun, definitely required. You will see but not just during this one month. And you will understand why if you watch the rest of this presentation. So as you can see, there's a lot to cover. We have a lot of material to get in. One more time in this presentation, you, you, every one of you will learn how you may be helpful today to your ancestors who are undergoing the hisab as we speak, who are still in that period after their life in suspension, waiting for their rehabilitation, waiting to prove their competency, certain competencies that we're going to talk about. They're waiting and they may depend on you. So therefore, you have a chance to be the catalyst, sort of the helper, the supporter, the, 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 the person who provides them uh, the, the, the last uh, bit of help they need to get over the hurdle to become part of al -Firdaus. And we're going to see all of these details. And they desperately need your help. You're going to see why. So, yeah, this is something, unfortunately, no one has talked about in the, in the level of detail that I'm talking about it today. But you're going to see it was under our nose all through the last 1,400 years. And subhanAllah, no one, no one has come forward to really stress it in the elegant way that you're going to see the Quran provides it to us. 
So let, uh, let us understand a few foundational concepts before we proceed. Um, uh, brother, uh, I did not say fasting is a duty. No, you, you misheard me and you're trying to misrepresent my words. I said, I cannot find that it's a duty for every Muslim. It is a duty for the advanced toilers and the muttaqum. If you keep doing this, I'm going to ask the moderators to remove you because you've done this multiple times before. I'm really sorry, and I hope you don't keep doing this. Don't twist my words. I did not say it's a duty. Right there, what I said is I cannot find that it's, that it's a duty. I cannot find clear definitive evidence that it's an obligation for every Muslim. So we cannot say it's a duty. However, it's a duty for the advanced muttaqun and definitely was practiced during the type, time of Muhammad وسلم, with his close companions. So I ask the, the uh, moderators to please watch out for people who try to twist the words and present their own agenda. All right, let's talk about the concept of idda. The concept of idda versus udda. This is really confusing for a lot of people who don't know Arabic. But for those who know Arabic, it's also confusing. So take uh, take peace in the fact that this is really a confusing word. There is idda with a kasra. Pay, pay attention to the kasra below the ayn. And there is idda with a dhamma above the ayn. And, um, uh, and that, is, that is the concept that we're presenting in here. So idda refers to count as in quantity and inshallah uh, you will you will keep this concept in mind as we um, um i'm trying to do something in here yeah actually what i'm gonna do is something else there we go all right there's uh, some disruptors who insist on uh changing the topics for us and we're not going to let that happen so um sorry about that let's go back to the video uh what happened here so we're gonna share yeah we're good so um can you see the the screen please give me a thumbs up if you can see the the text itself um uh, that would be great okay uh, let's continue. Uh, we have uh... yeah, sorry about that. This is what happened when disruptors want to run their own agenda over a public chat and uh, and a YouTube. Very good. The concept of idda versus odda. Idda with a kasra refers to count. Literally, that's all it means. A count, a number. I don't mean the number. I mean the, the concept of number. That's it. So you can't say it's seven or eight or nine, but, but the concept that it's a number is idda. There is a, there's a, a, a count that is part of a requirement of some sort. That's really it. Um, so I, that's idda with a kasra below it. So for example, we saw this in the segment about companions of the cave. سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم ويقولون خمسة سادسهم كلبهم رجما بالغيب etc etc قل ربي أعلم بعدتهم كسرة below the عين الله or my lord knows about their count we've seen this in the video about uh, the sleepers uh, of the cave so we're good uh, this is this is a good introduction to the word عدة we're gonna see this is really relevant pay attention it does not say a count of what, you know, the word idda doesn't tell you, doesn't tell you I'm talking about apples or I'm talking about stars or I'm talking about, you know, animals of some sort or nothing. Just idda, a count, that's it. A count that's some, some sort of a requirement usually used as part of a requirement. Keep this in mind because this is going to be critical to understand the ayat, the 10 ayat that we're going to cover from Surah Al-Baqarah. In contrast, the verb or the word udda with a ayn dhamma is about what's referred to as material in, in military lingo. 
in military uh, locution. So the concept of, you know, a soldier going to the battle, whatever that soldier needs in terms of, of material, of, of weapons, of ammunition, of uh, extra clothing, protection, gear, all of those things, that's called udda, something you prepare for a uh, military type of uh, encounter. So that's the concept of udda that occurs uh, as far as I could tell one time in the Quran, it may occur in some verbs, but in general, this is an example, 946. So the concept of udda, udda is not referred to in the ayat that we're going to talk about. What's referred to in the ayat that we're going to talk about is idda with a kasra, and that refers to a count, some sort of a requirement. That's it. And you're going to see it, inshallah. <coughs> Next concept, the concept of hisab. Um, I'm throwing concepts at you. I hope you take quick notes if you can. Uh, if you can't, I will remind you. But basically, we're going to see these concepts in the interpretation of the ayat 178 to 187 of Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, the topic of today, which is about CM. So we have an, another 10 minutes of concepts before we start diving into those ayat. So be patient, stay awake. You'll need these concepts. That's That's why I'm trying to simplify the presentation for your benefit. So please stay with me and focus so we can get through it very quickly. The concept of al-hisab or hisab in general. Al-hisab, it's used very heavily in the Quran in different, in different forms of the word, sometimes in the verb, sometimes in a noun, masdar, sometimes it's an adjective, sometimes etc. Al-hisab refers to, here's a surprise, it's a period of time. It's not about the accounting process itself. It's not about the accounting process itself. It refers to a period of time. This is something that most people did not see up till now. Inshallah, they will agree with me because the evidence is overwhelming. I've done the nested interpretation in full regarding this, and you'll see. It's referring about this concept of there's a period of time, people in suspension, and they have to do a certain number of things before they pass to the next level, hopefully for those. Or if they fail, downward. And we're going to see this in the story of Suleiman. So none of those concepts are plucked from thin air. All of these concepts are brought in from uh, direct access to detailed analysis of dhikr. So this is part of the methodology that we follow. Al-Hisab refers to a period of time where nufus are kept in suspension, suffering anguish and confusion. Yes, suffering anguish and confusion. Why? Because you're waiting. It's like waiting outside your uh, the door of your principal at school, in the hallway. Everybody sees you. And you don't know what the judgment is going to be as a result of that meeting with your principal at school, in high school. Or... You, you know, you've had an interview and you're waiting outside for the conclusion, for the result of those who did the interview with you for a job. Or you go to court, God forbid, and you're waiting for the judgment of the judge. That period is full of anguish and full of confusion. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. It's, it's, you're anxious, you're worried, and hopefully you want to get off. You want to get out of that period. That's the period of hisab. It's not a fun period. It's not a fun period. This is a period of anguish and suffering and confusion. And we're going to see more. They're pending their final success in achieving the idda. This is where the term idda comes in. Idda. So there is a idda. There's a number of things they have to do or succeed at, compete, uh, you know, develop competencies for. And unless and until they succeed, they don't get past this period of hisab. I'm not going to give you a lot of the evidence for this, but, but, but it's there. It's tons of information provided about this concept. We're going to see the ayat 178 to 187 refer to this concept. So, for example, from the Quran in Surah Yunus, ayah 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لِتَعْلَمُوا عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ وَالْحِسَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the, the, one of the purposes of the Quran is that you understand the concept of al-hisab. You get to learn about al-hisab, 
This is a new concept for the Quran. It was called something else before. We're going to see it. And this ayah has the signature, يُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the divarication and the detailed explanation for people who seek or who have evidence-based knowledge. And therefore, when we followed the evidence-based knowledge, this is the conclusion we got. The concept of hisab is a period of time. Please pay attention. I'm not stressing the concept of time. So it's not a limited period, like, you know, 10 days and you're up, or it's like going to jail. You have to stay for three years and then you're done. No, it's not. It's a period of time during which you have to do a certain number of tests and succeed. So it's the number of tests that matter. If that period of time ends up being 3,000 years, it is 3,000 years. If that period of time ends up being 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes, and so on and so forth. So I hope you understand the concept. So the period of time is not the key point. It's the idda that is the key point of al-hisab. So al-hisab is not a, a, a specific limited time period, although there is time involved in there. So it's not a limited time period. It could extend for thousands of years or millions of years even, or it could be as short as literally blink of an eye. So I hope you're starting to understand how the original concepts became butchered as we were taught such concepts of the afterlife since we were a kid. So what is the concept of ihtisab? Is that related to Ramadan? Of course, some of you who know a little bit of the narrations know that the word ihtisab was used by our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It refers to devotional acts, pay attention, devotional acts in this life. Al-Hisab is after death. The devotional acts I'm talking about, which is the, the concept of ihtisab, apply in this life. And they allow us to reduce the likelihood of suffering al-Hisab. So ihtisab is something we do so that we can avoid hisab. Well, how does that work? Well, think about it. You are an athlete. You train, you train, you train, you train really hard. Why? Because you want to avoid the disappointment when the actual test comes later. If you're a boxer, you will spar and take the punches and do the training and work really hard for six months, a year before the actual two-minute competition. Because in the two-minute battle or, or fight, you don't want to take the, the hits during that time. So what do you have to do? You prepare. Do you take hits during the preparation and the training? Of course. You're willing to suffer under controlled circumstances. That's ihtisab. That's ihtisab. So preparing so that you can avoid the embarrassment and the anguish and the suffering during hisab. That's the concept. Did our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam use the terminology that way? Yes. We're going to see in this narration. Again, this is corroboration. And you all know by now, we don't use narrations as the original source of understanding. But we corroborate what we understand from the Quran. Remember, Hisab, we understood it first from the Quran. As I said, there's a ton of evidence about this. But let's, let's look at what the concept says. So before I, I get into this ayah, let me remind you that there is a narration from Abu Huraira and reported in Al-Bukhari. Those of you who know narrations, I'm not going to even use the word hadith because you know better than that. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's what it says. Man qama Ramadan imanan wahtisaban. Whoever restores qama like qiyama. When? During this life, of course. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about this life. Ramadan, is he talking about that period of time? Yes, for him and his companions, of course, I said. For him and his companions, it was mandatory. But there is a reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave our beloved some knowledge. He is passing it on to us. That knowledge is, if you follow the concept of Ramadan, you're going to see what Ramadan means. doesn't mean what you think. As I said, the linguistics don't support the traditional understanding. So you need to be patient. It's coming yet. In Ayah 178. We're going we're gonna to get to that. Uh, sorry, in Ayah 180 or so. 
So, man qama Ramadan, whoever restores in the fashion of Ramadan. Ramadan, this is a hal. This is not a proper noun of a month. This is the hal. This is how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa spoke sometime using the style of the Quran. Man qama Ramadan, believing and seeking hisab, ihtisaban and imanan. Believing and seeking hisab in this life, meaning preparing himself for that hisab. Sort of rehearsing. He shall be granted reconnection despite whatever preceded of his sins in this life. This is the narration. So the important part, and this is why I brought this narration for your attention. Qala ibn Shihab, he's one of the people in the chain of transmission. Please pay attention. This is not wasting your time. I don't bring you stuff unless it's really critical and to understand the topic at hand. Ibn Shuhab, Ibn Shihab is one of the transmitters in the chain of transmission. He added, and this is documented in Al-Bukhari, and here's the number, etc., etc. Ibn Shihab said, the messenger of Allah died and the situation was like this, like he just described it in the narration. And the situation continued that way in the caliphate of Abu Bakr during the period which was two years, according to history, after Muhammad And it was also that way for the front part of Omar's Khilafah. Did you catch it? He's passing a message that Omar introduced something different. This is what the message is. Why is Al-Bukhari including it? I found that very often Al-Bukhari is passing us messages of this type. That's why I keep saying don't dismiss the narrations and the hadith because there are treasures there and we have to be able to learn what Al-Bukhari and others are passing information to us and how to sort of do some archaeological digging through the linguistics to understand what's going on. So you caught it. Here he's saying halfway, roughly, maybe the first five years of the Khilafah of Omar, because Omar uh, was a Khalifa for 12 years. Maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe eight years. It was that way. Qama Ramadan, imanan wahtisaban. And then something changed. That's what he's saying. So let's go back to the ayah to kind of conclude this issue of hisab. The hisab is basically uh, something that happened after we die. Okay, we understood this. But ihtisab is a devotional act in preparation, in rehearsal for the hisab. I hope you understand now what we're talking about. Because we've said hisab ends, is actually, you're successful in your hisab if you master certain uh, idda, quantity of some things you need to master. We're going to see the detail. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra is talking to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and by extension to all of us. وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَى أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا And at night, I'm going to come back to this alternatively. Um, at night, Enter your slumber using it, the Quran, because the previous ayat are talking about the Quran. As an additional obligatory devotional act. Nafilatan laka. Nafilatan means additional supererogatory, that kind of thing. But in this case, it says there is a benefit for you if you do it. And the ayah is highlighting something really important for Muhammad which is Mahmuda. So you have an extra requirement. What's the extra requirement? You do this not just as a selective elective, although sometimes you may skip, but it is for you. Why? Hoping that your Lord revivifies you, bring you back to life as uh, to, to a praised station. Maqaman Mahmudan Mahmudan. So now we understand this ayah in a totally different light. Let me let me show share with you the alternative. The alternative is a little bit more punchy. Wamina layl, it gives us the implication that you need to be careful of it. 
min al-layl to avoid the suffering of the night of siyam. We're going to see what that means. So I added it in here. You may not understand it until we go through the 10 ayat that we're going to cover in Surah Al-Baqarah. Wa min al-layl to avoid the suffering of night siyam. Then it is an obligatory thing for you. Perhaps as a reward, Allah will give you the final station faster without hisab. So this is part of the concept of hisab, even though the word hisab is not here. But we will talk more about this, inshallah, in future uh, in future segments. For this se for this segment, I need to keep moving because there's a lot of material that we have to put into place. All right, the concept of kutiba alaykum. Kutiba alaykum. Uh, yes, the brother uh, Sayyid. Hisab is milestone basis. Yes, exactly. And if you are late, it doesn't help you. And if you're uh, quick to go through Hisab, good for you because you have prepared. So that's the concept uh, that, that I want you to, uh, to, to take with you. Concept of Hisab is milestone based. We're going to see there's a specific count of things that you must pass tests you must pass in order to um, to get on beyond al-hisab in the afterlife. Now, kutiba alaykum. This is a word that's, or there's an expression that's used in the ayat that we're going to see, the 10 ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. So we need to deal with them. So I'm going to give you the translation and in future segments, I'll present more evidence and direct application. There are tons of applications to this concept. But again, because of the limited time, I can't cover everything in one segment. We still need to get to Siyam and Ramadan and Taraweeh in detail and, and so on and so forth. The translation is, this is accurate translation based on the concept of Kutiba Alaykum. If you take the literal translation, if pay attention. If you take the literal translation, translation it says, uh, on you, someone wrote. On you, some, someone wrote. So definitely not the correct translation. It says, Kutiba alaykum. Someone wrote on you, on top of you. Literally, physically. That's what it says. So that's not the meaning. We know that. So we have to go to Ibra and understand beyond it, what is Allah trying to teach us? So when we collect all of the ayat with similar style, Kutiba alaykum, etc., etc., katabna alayhim, do you understand that there is something else? They have been delegated, they have been delegated to perform a duty. The duty in this case, we're going to see it in more detail, is a decree to pass a judgment. Pass a judgment against whom? You're going to find out it's against people, some people, nufus, in suspension, after their physical death, awaiting judgment? Yes, exactly. And you're going to understand the concept. Now you're starting to develop the concept. So the concept is there's a whole bunch of people awaiting judgment. Guess who is going to be judging those nufus? Yeah, you guessed it. The people who, un who understand the kitab, the scripture. Kutiba alaykum. You have been delegated. The decision or the, the sort of the, the onus or the responsibility has been relegated to you from Allah, from your Lord. You accepted this responsibility when you started engaging the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will trust you to judge. Is that fair to those people? Absolutely fair. Because remember, those people either refused to learn the locution and the proper vocabulary, or they made a mistake of epistemic shirk. They associated other human beings. They're really the same case, if you think about it. Why did they not learn? Because they thought we already know, or we don't need to know. Either way, epistemic shirk. You're rejecting the supremacy of Allah over the linguistic authoritativeness of his book, of his scripture. Either way, epistemic shirk. So epistemic shirk, shirk. That means they associated some other human beings with Allah. Guess what? Other human beings will be the judges over you, mister. I hope it makes sense. I hope, I hope it, it rattled your chair right now. Because this is the concept that we're dealing with. And you're going to see it. So, kutiba alaykum, there are living human beings to whom Allah delegated, relegated the responsibility 
of either supporting, teaching, or judging, ultimately judging those who are in this suspended state. And we're going to see they have a name, and the Quran gives them a name. In, according, in accordance with what? In accordance with the divine scripture. So is this privilege or relegation given to just anyone? No, to those who understand what these ayat are saying. And that's why these ayat have never been really fully understood yet. And you're going to understand, during the life of Muhammad وسلم, they were understood. Then they lost it, as we just saw with the taraweeh. They lost the concept. And now, by their own admission, by the way, this is not something I'm making up. They're admitting, Ibn Shihab, Ibn Shihab Din Zuhri, he, act, he admitted this, and Bukhari documented it. We're not making it up. We're getting their own books to testify against them. The same thing in here. These concepts were known during the life of Muhammad وسلم, and you're going to see some narrations that confirm this. And then we lost these concepts for the last 1400 years. So we're not bringing a new religion. We're bringing back the original understanding of the Quran. So as I said, I conducted detailed nested interpretation research, and this conforms to all the observations every single time. And this is corroborated by dozens of other ayat and concepts. And we will cover later in the series on Sulaiman and probably in other series. Probably it requires its own series, this whole concept of kutiba alaykum. It is so uh, multifaceted and, and really hairy, uh, but it's really critical. You, can, you cannot go on with your life without really understanding this. All right, let's move on. The concept of ayyam and ma'dudat. So, so far we're presenting a few concepts. We're almost done, I promise you. And we're going to get started with the ayat 178 to 187 from Surah Al-Baqarah. So, the concept of ayyam and ma'dudat, we're going to start with this uh, part from Surah Ali Imran. From Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 23. This, this is, by the way, the ayat right before Quli Allahumma. And in, in a future segment, I'm going to get back to those ayat, and you're going to see how relevant these ayat in here are. So in this, uh, in this concept or in, these, in this paragraph, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Muhammad. أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ Have you not pondered those who in the future would have been allowed to learn a portion um, from the scripture. Why did I add in the future? Because this is the expression in here. Alam tara ila. Ila in Arabic, it's, it's referred to as intiha al ghaya. Intiha al ghaya, the end destination. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is pointing Muhammad to look forward, to look to the end destination, sort of. Uh, a period that comes after him. الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ A group of people who have been uh, who have been allowed to learn a portion from the scripture. أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ يُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Being invited to the scripture of Allah. Who do you think is inviting them? Inviting them to the scripture of Allah. Today, today, people who are like us, inshallah. So that the linguistic discernment to arbitrate among them comes from the book, from the scripture, from the Quran. But then a group of, of, among them refuses while they are dismissive. Refuses while they are dismissive. Let's continue. ذلك بأنهم قالوا لن تمسنا النار إلا أياما معدودات. That is because they said, this is how serious this concept is, أياما معدودات. The original sin for these people, if you want to use that term, is what? They said, we shall not be affected by the nar except for a limited number of days. Ayyam and madudat. Well, what's their concept of nar? Their concept of nar is the punishment of hellfire. Because in their mind, remember, they've, they've, only, they've only acquired, learned a small portion of the scripture. So... Their concept of the hellfire and paradise and Jannah and Nar is the model that they learned from the biblical uh, model, which is all over in the books of Tafsir. This is the only, the only game in town, the only story we are told. The biblical model of the hellfire and 
uh, and paradise. We're not told the Quranic model. We're going to see the Quranic model. Dramatically different. So as they understand it, the concept of hellfire. So they say in that concept of their, the, their understanding of hellfire and Nar to them, Jahannam, they confuse Nar and Jahannam and all of those things are the Jahim is the same thing. Everything to them is the same thing. In their mind, they said, we're only going to be affected by a number of days. What's so dangerous about this? We're insisting that it's not time-based. It's a period of time, but the, the time is not the essence. It's a number of milestones you have to go through that's the essence. They're twisting that understanding. They're saying it's like a prison. You go to a prison, even if you're innocent, you're going to have to spend a certain number of days. You have three years, you have to pass, and then you get out. Well, what does that mean? That means even in prison, you don't have to submit. You don't have to confess to your crimes. That's the concept of ayyam and ma'budat. That's the danger of that concept. So it's a way for them to keep resisting the teachings from the Quran, even if they end up in the hellfire. They're saying, we will sustain it. Allah promised he's not going to kill us. So, okay, we'll live through it. Number of days, number of years, whatever it is, limited number of days, time-based. Eventually, Allah will let us out. That's the mentality, the mentality of conceit and deceit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us. This is the seed, sort of the, the original sin for these people. And further describes them in the ayah. وَغَرَّهُمْ فِي دِينِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتَرُونَ And they were deluded. They were deluded in their religion. They, their own religion. Allah refers to it as their own religion. دِينِهِمْ This is their own religion. By what they concocted. So the danger of teaching or even accepting the model that there is a limited number of time, days, duration after which we're let out is that it reflects conceit and deceit and arrogance and not submission to Allah, refusing to submit to Allah. Even if you're in the hellfire, they're saying, it doesn't matter, we'll wait it out. I hope you understand how serious that is. So what happens to them? Allah conf confirms and continues in the next ayah. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جَمَعْنَاهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ How about then, when we collect them, attributing them to a time in which there is no doubt. Uh, pay attention now. Liyawmin, the letter lam sometimes means attributing them, meaning assigning them to that period, to that time period. Remember, it's not about the time. It's just the, the duration. What's so special about that duration? La rayba fi. There is no doubt in it. So if you are there with doubt, you're going to stay there. You're not going to get out the end of that period, so to speak, will not come to you unless you get rid of those doubts. Get rid of those misunderstandings. And if they were based on conceit, guess what? You're going to have to get rid of that conceitedness. In a narration, most of you already have heard it, Jannah is not available, is not accessible to anyone in whose core there is an atom's weight of conceit. So our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to that narration, told us the exact same concept. So don't come attacking me. I'm not bringing anything new. I'm bringing the original. It's just that they didn't teach us that way. So the concept of hisab and the concept of, uh, of these people who talk about ayyam and ma'dudat, these people who talk about ayyam and ma'dudat is what we hear in the masajid, is what we hear from all of the superstars and, and the imams and so on and so forth. So this is not a new concept. I'm just clarifying the Quran brings us a period. It says a period. There should be no doubt about that period. What does that mean? So at the end of Hisab for you is Yawmul Qiyamah, restoration. Restoration based on what? Based on having no doubt left about you. So if you've lived your life saying I'm a Muslim, saying uh, you know, I submit to Allah, even making your 
salat, as you say, and doing all of the things. But in the back of your mind, even if I make some mistakes, I go a few days. Ah, a few days, then this, this paragraph fits you. This paragraph fits you. Why? Because it's based on conceit. It's based on assuming a separate the deen, religion, that they concocted. So we continue. La raiva fi. There's no doubt in that time or about that time. Both are allowed in this Arabic, uh, in the Arabic syntax. So getting out of that time should come at a point where there's no more any doubt. That means the period of hisab is the period where you are there in the first place because there's a question mark. Because there's a, a, a period of question mark in your life. وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ And then every nafs is remunerated only what it earned, what about that time? وُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ Every nafs is remunerated only what it earned. So if you earned such doubtful behavior in your life, guess what? You're going to be remunerated with being treated with doubt. So in, in, in the legal lingo, they refer to that person as uh, uh, on parole. You know, he's doubtful. He's not yet out of the prison system, but he's, uh, you know, he's not really out of the prison system uh, or, you know, normal life yet. So he's not in prison, but he's not out of the prison system yet. He's on parole. This is the same concept in here. Parole. So this person has a question mark on his behavior, on his beliefs, on his actions during his life. He's put in suspension. This is the hisab that we're talking about. There is much more about all of these concepts in the upcoming MQ Lives, all of them, every uh, first and third Sunday of the month. Inshallah, we'll keep doing them in Ramadan too, exclusively on Zoom, exclusively for website subscribers at level two and more. So we'll continue. I know you have a lot of questions, and uh, uh, but but I really need to continue. So one more concept, I promise you, one last concept, and we'll dive into the ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah, and they're going to be relatively clear because we built all of these concepts. This whole presentation is an explanation of one ayah from Surah Al-Furqan. This this sort of seals it. This is the glue that brings everything together. And watch, and you're going to understand, oh my God, it's so obvious, right in front of our eyes. And everyone missed it. Oh Allah, forgive us. قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَ دُعَاءُكُمْ فَقَدْ كَذَّبْتُمْ فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا Say, of what concern would you be to my Lord, were it not for your proper supplication, dua? فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا Allah taught us. To Allah belongs the noble or the, the, the insightful labels, nouns, nouns, not names, nouns. Allah used all of this vocabulary in the Quran with insight and you refuse to learn them. So, but Allah is telling you, to Allah belongs these nouns with insight. So therefore use them to make dua. Dua'ukum. If it were not for your supplication, proper supplication, Allah would not care about you. What does that mean? That means you're going to be put in this hisab, forgotten. Watch. فَقَدْ كَذَّبْتُمْ You rationalized for yourselves and others to belie the belying of ayat and the belying of instructions from Allah. You've belied. Some people attack me. You know, this word is, is a fallacy. You should not do this. An Abrahamic locution, no, Allah is not a robot. And all of this garbage that they throw at us to, to rationalize, to rationalize belying the signs and the evidence we're presenting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you have rationalized belying the, this evidence. Guess what? It shall become obligatory upon you. What does that mean? It shall become obligatory upon you. During hisab, remember I said idda? There is a specific requirement in terms of account you must pass a number of tests. Guess what? By belying certain evidence, those evidence, that evidence or those concepts become part of your idda for the hisab period. So let's read it again. Of what concern would you be to my Lord were it not for your supplication? So you have to learn the supplication. 
but you rationalized for yourself the belying of such ayat, the ayat that I just read, or any of the ayat that we've used and, and showed to explain the necessity of doing the right dua. So you have belied and rationalized to yourself and others. And thus, it shall become obligatory upon you. What does that mean? That means if you have, let's say, a number of X for idda, for your hisab, you just add it to it. Well, Dr. Hani, okay, during idda, we can easily learn it. Allah can give us the knowledge. Uh, uh, uh. Allah is not going to talk to you. Allah is going to forget about you. What do you have to do? We're going to see. This is what Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 178-187 is all about. So I'm setting the stage. Yes, I'm taking a long time. Yes, I'm, under I'm trying to get you to understand the seriousness of the issues. But once you understand the seriousness of the issues, you will see 178 through to 187, those ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah will fit perfectly, will make, will light up, will just give us all sorts of uh, confirmation of all of these concepts. So to summarize, those who rationalize the belying of specific concepts from the ayat <clears throat> shall have these concepts added to their mandatory requirements for al-hisab. So by belying and rationalizing, kathabtum, there's a shadda in there. If you remember, the shadda indicate you rationalize, you come up with criteria, you justify why you should not accept a certain ayah. Such as when we talk about Ayah 102 in Surah uh, Yusuf. No, 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 no. It's not saying ذلك من أنباء الغيب. It means, uh, you know, Muhammad did not know it. غيب for Muhammad. Well, the Ayah does not say it. So you're rationalizing why you should go to the Bible and borrow their corrupted story about Yusuf. And so on and so forth. That's rationalizing. You rationalize, guess what? You're going to have extra mandatory requirement and this shall become extra so just imagine just just for those of you who have seen the series watch the series on yusuf 30 part series just imagine just imagine you have in hisab a period of time a duration and by the way you don't have access to the quran during that time we're going to see more about that you don't have access to the quran that's why taraweeh is really important. Yeah, it's a good practice, but it has to be done in the right way. You don't have access to the, to the Quran. And you don't have access to the basic knowledge about the terminology. How are you going to decipher, break the code of Surah Yusuf? It, it, it's, it's a very heavy decoding process. If you don't learn it in this life, good luck. Good luck learning it when you don't have access to eyes and ears. And we don't, you don't have access to direct access to the Quran. You understand now, the concept of hisab is something very serious. So let's continue. Keep watching. You will learn how you may be helpful to your ancestors who are undergoing the hisab period and desperately need your help. So, um, <clears throat> So I said this is the last concept. Well, there's one more concept I want to summarize um, in a kind of like flowchart, the Quranic afterlife model. I will put it up on the screen. You'll get a chance to read it again. So let me uh, make it smaller so it all fits in one place. Here, let's do that. Okay. So this is sort of a flowchart, but there's too much text, to be honest with you, to put it in a graphic form. So let's go through it very quickly. If you reject Allah, remember, this is different than the biblical hell and heaven type of model that we, we, that we were taught. Those of you who have, uh, who have attended the MQ Live sessions during the summer, past summer since July until now, uh, you've heard a lot more detail and the evidence and a lot of explanations. So this is based on the Quranic uh, model of of the afterlife. So what happens when we die? If you reject Allah, so-called atheist, uh, there's something called hijr, which is roughly translated as quarantine, sort of isolation, total isolation, plus repeated periods of Jahannam, wherein you become a Qareen for a living person. You're brought in, 
and you're inserted, you're, you're sort of stuffed into a living person. And the image is that living person is stomping on you day in and day out. And all you can do is reinforce the erroneousness of that living person. So that's sort of a Jahannam concept uh, visualized a little bit. Number two, if you associate with Allah, if you, remember this one reject. If you associate with Allah, including epistemic shirk, there is hijr, there is hijr, possibly, or hisab, depending on Allah, we'll see. Plus repeated periods of Jahannam, becoming a Qareen for, a living, per, for living persons. So how about those who insist, Dr. Hani, you're not allowed to teach the Quran. Dr. Hani, you're not allowed to interpret the Quran. Dr. Hani, you're not allowed to read it and understand it as you please. What are they doing? Well, you have to go to the Salaf, the first three generations. They are the ones who understand. Go through them. Those are yabghunaha iwajan. They seek a crookedness in the process of connecting to Allah. Those are the people I'm talking about in here. Those who associate with Allah. You can't learn it by yourself. You're forbidden to ask questions. Whoever is making that claim will suffer hijr. I guarantee you. Because they're putting themselves or whoever they choose, salaf, in between human beings and Allah. That's directly to hijr. No question about it. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih. Allah does not, does not reconnect with someone who has introduced that type of shirk, that type of association. And he reconnects with, uh, with anyone else below such level of, of gravity. Well, shirk is not a sin. No, shirk is not a sin. Shirk is a state of being. And if you choose to be in a state where you associate with your creator, guess what? Your creator doesn't want to have anything to do with you. I hope it's really clear. So you are put in hijr. If you believe in Allah, this is number three. If you believe in Allah and correctly toiled on the Quran, then you go directly to Firdaus. That's it. It's very simple. The, the, the passing grade is not that difficult. <clears throat> of course, you have to apply what you've learned. And that means you escaped being part of those who are stomped in the future. Jahannam, but you also know how to reject those who are coming possibly to be part of Jahannam for you. So you know how to defeat them, you know how to respond to them, you have learned, you're learning, and you're applying that the, the correct vocabulary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, has been teaching us uh, on this channel and throughout the whole Quran. Number four, if you believe in Allah, but we're not given any opportunity to learn. Uh, we know a lot of people like that, right? They've never re learned to read and write. And as a matter of fact, they have never been taught the Quran. Some people live in the Amazon, right? Or they live in Siberia or live in you know, Eskimos or whatever. What, what's their condition? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put them through hisab. And in some cases, hisab and yasira. Hisab and yasira. Very simple hisab. You know, hisab that's easy for them to recognize. But the condition is you believe in Allah. You don't reject the creator. There's no way to look around anywhere on this, on this, on the in this universe and say, well, this happened by itself. Those, those are idiots. They don't even be, belong in any kind of future future vision for humanity. They don't believe that there is a creator. So to you, there is no creator. No one will care about you. You're in quarantine permanently without end, end of the story. And if you really know, want to know what that means, try solitary confinement in your own room, in the darkness, without food, without drink, for just three days, and then report back to me. Just three days. So imagine for eternity. That's what hijr means. It's not something light. It's a lot worse than some of the images they told us about in in uh, in uh, the typical traditional stories. So this is for a person who believes in Allah, but was not given any opportunity to learn. But what about believing in Allah and then 
any Quranic evidence or principle you rationalize to yourself to dismiss, meaning you rationalize dismissing the evidence. Yes, dismissing the evidence. You have hisab, as we said, the, the page right before this one. فَقَدْ كَذَّبْتُمْ فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا The last ayah of Surah Furqan, Surah 25. So that's it become now an obligatory thing upon you. Okay, wonderful. for for Not for him, but wonderful. So you are in hisab, including idda, but guess what? All of those concepts you belied and rationalized to yourself why you should belie them. Now they are added to your list of to do during hisab. So your nafs after death is in hisab and you have additional burdens added to your list of to do. Next, um, if you believe in Allah, hisab including idda, minimum number of concepts. Yeah, that applies. As I said, this is number five, sorry. If you believe in Allah and you have actively toiled on the Quran, you have practiced shukur, you did not rationalize to yourself uh, to belie or dismiss any Quranic evidence, then no hisab, direct access to Jannah, plural. So, but does that work for anyone? Yeah, it works for actively toiling and doing shukur. Remember, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا دُعَاءُكُمْ If you make the dua, the correct dua, Allah cares about you. He's not going to let you suffer. That's what the ayah says. So that's the flip side of the same understanding of that ayah. Well, what if you neglect or turn away? Then you're thrown into either hisab or worse, jahannam through hijr. So let's get started on the ayat. <laughs> Finally, we get to this after an hour and 20 minutes. I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can get through this. We have 13 pages, more than half the presentation left, but hopefully we'll get through it quickly. So I'm going to start with Ayah 178. Please, if you are not um, ready for this, leave it to later, come back to it, because this requires quite a bit of focus, but it's easy, relatively easy, because we've covered so many topics now. The, the beauty of these ayat is that Allah gives us a clear example and then follows on with the ayat that talk about siyam. And we're going to see. It fits so beautifully. So let's start with this. Ya ayu alladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-qisasu fil qatla O you who believed. It has been delegated upon you. Remember, this is the translation I'm choosing and you'll see why. It has been delegated upon you in the past scripture. Of course, ya ayu alladhina amanu, those who, who, who were before the Quran. To judge, to judge what? Kutiba alaykum al qisas to judge uh, regarding the retribution for the murdered ones, fil qatla. So the, the scenario is someone was killed, who gets to judge what happens to the murderer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Kutiba alaykum, it has been prescribed or delegated to you to judge, to make that judgment. I hope the image is really clear. There's no other way to understand it. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْقِصَاصُ فِي الْقَتْلَةِ He's not talking about the, the murderer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا as a group are in charge of bringing judgment against the murderer, meaning who committed a murder of some sort. Now, الْحُرُّ بِالْحُرُّ وَالْعَبْدُ بِالْعَبْدُ وَالْأُنْثَ بِالْأُنْثَ This is lingo language specific to them and they understand it. The free for the free and the slave for the slave and the feminine for the feminine. What matters is the ibra for us. What is the ibra? That means whatever you do, you get punished in accordance with what you do. And the punishment is of the same type as the original sin. That's the concept. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is including this. So he's reminding them there is equivalence between the original sin that you committed, the, the first sin or the sin you committed, and the punishment you receive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, this is how it works, because we're going to see later when he talks about siyam, guess what? He's talking about similar concepts. So first, kutiba alaykum, the same thing, kutiba alaykum. We're going to see it. And this equivalence between the sin and the punishment, and you're going to see it. فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ But whosoever, anything is absolved by his brother, meaning... Let's say X person made a mistake or killed, you know, uh, his neighbor. 
Well, the family of the neighbor have the right to forgive. This is all in, in, in their books. But it's also in our books. You'll see. If, if he's absolved, if he's forgiven by the family of the deceased, the murdered person, then what's the instruction? Allah does not leave it there. This is the beautiful part. Then let there be for him an opportunity following with understanding in accordance with what's acceptable in the scripture. What does that mean? That means, yeah, you can forgive him. Why? Because you should hope for him to reform himself, to relearn, to do better, what we call it, rehabilitation during this life. So this concept of killing people is not a given in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying something better is maybe if you forgive that person, if you're willing, if you find it in your heart, if he's your brother, if you think of him as your brother, and then follow through for him to learn the right understanding in accordance with what's acceptable from the scripture. In other words, learn to toil. And then we deliver for him. Let there be an opportunity for delivering to him with insightfulness. This is insightfulness from the scripture. And he learns insightfulness about the scripture in the same way. So the concept here is, first Allah is reminding them that, hey, I've given you delegation, I've delegated to you, relegated to you, the responsibility to pass judgments against the murderers, fine. But if someone is forgiven, if someone is forgiven, he's talking to the person being forgiven. فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ He is the one being forgiven. Then follow through with ma'roof. Make this a good opportunity for a new beginning to do what? To repair your life and connect with Allah with the right understanding. So in other words, this is a higher goal than actually killing the murderer. I hope you see how beautiful it is already setting the stage. Would it be unfair? I'm not saying this should happen. This, this is saying, فَمَنْ عُوفِيَ لَهُ Whoever is forgiven. So if, if, the, if the family of the victim doesn't want to do it, don't do it. Allah is not forcing you to do it. You are, you are given a delegation, a delegatory authority to pass the judgment and to request the... the the you know capital punishment against the murderer yes of course allah is not taking that away from you but if he's taking he's talking to the one being forgiven if you are forgiven from your brother something then follow through with the right understanding according to what's acceptable in the scripture of course let there be an opportunity for deliver back to him insightfulness from the scripture this is a lessening, a lowering of the standard, so to speak. Not lowering of the standard, really. It's actually increasing of the standard. But lowering of the burden, the prior impositions, the prior heavy capital punishment that is filled in, that, that the Torah is filled with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is a lessening of those burdens. How is it lessening? Because if you find a way to forgive, then that person may actually seek a new life. Ah, new life. Watch the next ayah. Let's continue this one and then we'll see the next ayah. Remember, new life. But whoever uh, commits aggression after that, let there be for him a painful punishment. So as they say in, in California, three strikes and you're out. And I know this is grossly abused in California, but the same concept here. You know, three strikes or two strikes, you don't get the benefit of being forgiven again. This is what this ayah is saying. Purely about capital punishment, purely about retribution in criminal cases, you understand the setup. Why did I start with this? You'll see. It applies exactly to what the concept of CM is all about. Huh? Yeah, you'll see. By the way, those of you who are subscribed to the website, uh, level two or above will get the notes, including all of the detailed references and everything that I'm talking about. So 2179, remember, remember I said a new life. Okay, 
ولكم في القصاص حياة يا أولي الألباب لعلكم تتقون And there is for you, forget about this one for now, in retribution, an opportunity for real life in the afterlife. Why am I saying that? And this is addressing people of the fifth, that you may become disciplined in engaging the scripture. Remember I said the hisab, the concept of hisab is about rehabilitation. So while you are in hisab, while you are in this hisab in suspension, are you living? No, you're not. Are you dead? No, you're not. And there are some ayat that talk about this and we're going to see more about them in the future. So what are you? Suspended. Allah forgotten about you. Well, what opportunities do you have? You will come seeking. You will come seeking to learn from living people. Mm, now we're starting to think. So some of our ancestors who are in this period of hisab, in suspension, are coming to learn from us? Yeah, we've talked about this. We've talked about this before. فَنَقَّبُوا فِي الْبِلَادِ هَلْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ They went searching through the physical bodies, meaning the living people. Is there a way out? They're looking for anyone to teach them. Anyone to teach them, but they can't talk. So what's their opportunity? If some groups of people are actually doing toiling, conversing, following through on what they're learning from the scripture, the ancestors in the form of those people in Hisab come to learn. Come to learn. Come to learn from whom? From people with whom they are familiar. Your ancestors, number one on the list. So in Qisas, this is a Qisas. This is a form of Qisas. We're going to see. It's talking about Qisas. Because being put in Hisab is a form of Qisas. It's not a final Qisas, final punishment or retribution. But hopefully you get a life through it. Well, it may take you a while. If you're lucky, you have good descendants and, and uh, progeny who can easily give you this knowledge. But it's better if you do it in your life, don't you think? <laughs> of course it is. This is the purpose of this whole concept. Per chance you get to be disciplined in engaging the scripture. So let's continue. Here's another example. Kutiba alaykum. Ida hadara ahadakum al maut. In taraka khayran al wasiyatu. Lil walidain wal akrabina bil marufi hakan al muttaqin. It has also been delegated upon you. Kutiba alaykum. The same concept. Focus. The ayat are talking about kutiba alaykum. Delegated upon you in accordance with the divine scripture. To do what? To judge or to pass some sort of information. You're, you're going to see. إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَّةِ So when one of you recognizes the nearness or inevitability, inevitability of physical death, meaning he feels death is close, when that person is in that situation, if he leaves behind a good understanding, إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا If he leaves behind good understanding. What does that mean? It means he's knowledgeable. He has evidence-based knowledge that he has not disclosed yet. Well, don't wait. Don't wait until you die. Do it before. al a recommendation. What do you do? Well, of course, you teach others. But what else? You recommend. You make a recommendation. Now, focus. The recommendation is not talking about the will, the, the wealth type of will, because the word wasiya is used in, or the root wasa or wasa or wasaya is used in all sorts of different ways in the Quran. So I'm choosing to translate it as uh, heritage, heritage, wasiyya, heritage, any type of intellectual heritage, knowledge, or wealth, any of those are referred to as heritage. And that's the original definition of the word heritage in English, by the way. It's not just inheritance. So any kind of heritage you leave behind, wasiyya, must include something you make a recommendation on behalf for the benefit of or against the birth parents or the relatives and the relatives. What does that mean? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when time is near, remember to give advice, to give a recommendation to those after you. Now pay attention. Person who's dying is the parent. Those after you, likely your children, your nieces, your nephews, maybe your brothers. Okay. The recommendation is don't forget about 
your birth parents and the other relatives. Well, the person is dying is making that recommendation. He's telling them, don't forget to give me the benefit of khair. You may come across later. We're going to see it. So the same concept, bil ma'roof, the one we saw up there in the case of the criminal, in the case of the murderer, bil ma'roof. Now, this is haqqan ala al-buttaqeen, haqqan ala al It's an obligation upon the, the, the ones disciplined in engaging the scripture. So in other words, it is required, it's required for you, um, it's required for you to, to do this, to pass this wasiya. Why? And by the way, this is this is no longer talking about Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Aman. First example was about Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Aman. Now this is talking to us, making a recommendation. Pay attention. Because it's a new ayah. It's a separate ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, remind those after you, left behind, by you. In the case you left good ilm, good knowledge, good understanding. Well, they're likely to continue that knowledge and that understanding. And they're likely to continue developing it. And they need to remember you in their study circles, in their opportunities for learning more. Why? Because you will need it. I hope you understand how the circle. Now we're going to see the next ayah confirms this. And whoever alters that heritage, that knowledge, after he has heard it, then the sin of altering it is only upon those who have altered it. So, in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling this person who's dying, if you feel near, don't worry about they may change it after me. Allah will take care of that. The sin of altering it is not upon you, the person who's dying. Okay. Well, what happens if they do alter it? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَإِنَّمَا إِثْمُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يُبَدِّلُونَهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Why this expression in here? Indeed, Allah is the provider of hearing, the exposer of evidence-based knowledge. Because Samia is a response from Allah to the person making dua. So if your progeny and descendants make the right dua anyway, Allah will give them the right guidance, even if somebody has modified it along the path. Let me repeat it. This is so critical. So a narration from our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got modified, corrupted, butchered in the process of transmission. The concept is lost. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala did not lose that concept. He will give it to someone looking for it through dua, even if 1400 years later. Did you get it? You understand what I just said? So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala does not hold Muhammad responsible for saying the right thing or any of the close companions for saying the right things and leaving the right wasiyah. Those who modified it afterwards are the ones responsible. And Allah is Samia Alim when we ask for the same type of information. Allah gives it to us. Beautiful concept. Spiritual connection across ages, across 1400 years. So they are our brothers and sisters. And we continue. Alim, he is the source of knowledge anyway. Don't worry about it. The next ayah. Now remember, this first ayah, 181, is talking about the person who is dying. Okay? So don't worry. Leave the wasiyah, leave the heritage, and, you know, go to your way. You'll be taken care of in the afterlife. Because, you know, muttaqun. Remember, this is muttaqun. Haqqan ala al-muttaqin. Now, next one. فَمَنْ خَافَ مِنْ مُوسٍ جَنَفًا Whoever fears from someone le leaving a heritage. Musin, someone leaving a heritage. So if you're the son listening to your parent, father, mother, grandpa, grandpa, leaving you a heritage, that's corrupted. That's wrong. What do you do? أَوْ إِثْمًا Even a, a sin. It includes a sin in it. You know, something sinful in the way they're making dua, in the way they think. أَيَّمًا مَعْدُودَاتِ Or... Allahumma, or any of those sinful things that we consider them a big deal. Okay, what do we do? It's polluting the heritage. Well, it's okay. Take it as it is. Don't swallow it. Don't go eat it. Correct it. But then he corrects it afterwards. Among them. This is a real key word in here. Bainahum. Among them. I'm going to underline this. Fa'aslaha bainahum. He corrects among them. Among whom? 
well among al walidin well al walidain wal aqrabin the parents and the, the birth parents and the and the uh, relatives of course you need to fix what they heard meaning you bring the new knowledge to them it's your responsibility within your fa- within your family yes within your family what else bainahum includes the deceased person yes it does because the deceased person is going to go where is going to go to hisab because he has some corruption in his aqida in his dua in the way he taught so he's going to have to come back to learn from whom from you so bainahum among them includes the person who was deceased the musi the one who left this heritage that has a corruption and pollution in it so in other words when we are working on cleaning up this heritage that we have whom are we helping we're helping our parents of course our deceased parents yes they may have taught us yes they are desperate to learn the right way because they can't get out of the suspension in which they're in unless they learn from whom while well, you're the one who is closest to them to teach them the right way the right uh, uh, you know the yusr remember yusr so they will look to you first what happens if they come to you and they can't find that knowledge they turn away in disappointment and they don't know where to go fanaqabu fil bilad hal min mahis you understand how significant how um, sinister not sinister in a bad way but sinister for us if we don't do it this situation is <clears throat> so fala ithma alayh that person that person who who makes a correction of course has no sin against them indeed allah is amenable to reconnect with him why did allah say this ghafurun rahim who made the sin allah told us there's no ithm there's no there's no sin against the one making the making the correction that means allah is ghafur and rahim to one of the bainahum one of them meaning bainahum includes the person who made the mistake in the first place the one who left the heritage with the pollution in it so to summarize this this is such a stunning ayah this is such a beautiful concept we're not doing the correction only for ourselves as some of you who have been on the mq live who heard me talk about the afterlife model our benefit extends to all of the predecessors including all of those who made the mistakes without knowing it was a mistake they're rushing to come learn we have to provide all of this knowledge in the language and the locution they understand so that they can hang hang on to the rope and keep pulling until they learn and get themselves out of the trouble they're in even after 1400 years some of them yes even after 10000 years some of them yes if they don't find anyone to teach them the right way remember they can't express they don't have senses they don't have physical means to walk and 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 so on so they're just sensing in the dark so to speak so if they don't find the right person to give this new knowledge necessary knowledge to get them out of their trouble they remain there what happens the image now is becoming clearer so they are in suspension they're not given anything to consume no food they're not given anything to drink to quench their thirst this is these are the concepts that the quran talked about regarding you know consuming the right eats ukul which is in janna and allah provides us the drinks so now you understand where the concept of fasting is going so the concept of fasting um the concept of fasting continues ya ayyuhal ladina amanu just like all of those other examples that i just shared with you now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming back to ya ayyuhal ladina amanu specifically ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kutiba alaykum as-siyam those who are in a state of fasting plural the word siyam is plural huge shock huge shock the word siyam is not just a masdar yes it is a masdar i know and in some cases it is used the masdar 
but in some cases it is used as plural. Well, plural, like idam, the same form, idam. I'm going to enlarge this so you guys can see this uh, at the bottom in the notes. So, siyam, the same form as idam, as kiram, as qiyam, as khiyam, all Quranic words, the exact same form, and they mean, and they mean plural. So what does that mean? They're, they're plural, plural of sa'im. So who is the sa'im? Who are the siyam in this case? They are the ones in suspension that I've been telling you about. So they have been prescribed or you, you have been delegated. It's been delegated upon you. Who is delegated to you? Siyam. Remember in the case of the murderer, who passes the judgment? The living. The living passes the judgment. The rest of society. Who passes the judgment upon Siyam? The living. This is exactly the same concept. Kutiba alaykum. The same group of people being addressed in this ayah are the ones delegated to pass judgment, to, to, to pass judgment and to correct. And to correct. Remember, rehabilitation hisab includes rehabilitation and passing the test. And if you don't pass the test, guess what? There is a judgment being passed. So remember ayah, ayah 77 of surah 25 you have you have you know rationalized for yourself and others to be lie about this ayat now they're added to your to-do list You're, they're added to your homework so to speak you have to prove competency before you pass on so learning from the descendants become an obligation so allah is saying to the descendants it has been delegated upon you. Al-Siyam, those in that state of fasting, those in suspension, hungry for food, food, eats, sustenance, hungry for drinks, divine rain does not reach them. And we have so many scenes uh, in the Quran that describe these kind of cases. Just like it has been written upon those before you. Who are the ones upon whom it was written. Well, the few ayat that we just read, just like in the case of Wasiya, and just like in the case of the murderer and how to judge the murderer, kutiba, kutiba alaykum. It's, it's been delegated to you. That's what the word means. So kutiba alaykum, just like it has been delegated to those before you. What does that mean? That means those before you who left the wasiya, remember the person who died and left the wasiya is aware of this concept. So he's making a wasiya to his descendants. Dr. Henry, you're going too far with this. No, 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 I'm not. The case of Ibrahim, biha Ibrahim banihi wa Yaqub, the exact same concept. He left a heritage for his children. And then in the case of, of uh, both, in Surah Al-Baqarah, by the way, also in the case of Yaqub, um, uh, if, if you know, Yaqub, uh, uh, if Yaqub al Maut, Fakala Libanihi, Abaniya, Mat Abuduna, Mimbadi, Kaluna Abudu Ilaha Abaika, Ibrahim, or Ismail, or Ishaka, or Yaqub, Ibrahim, or Ishak, sorry, Ibrahim, or Ismail, or Ishak. So the children are memorizing this concept. This is the heritage being passed. Wasa. Wasa and Yaqub is questioning them, not just, just not just passing it passively. He's saying, Are you sure you understand? Because I need to learn. They also mentioned this Ma'il, even though, as we said, Aba referred to not just the ones before Yaqub, but many who come later, including Ismail who comes later. So Yaqub is telling them, make sure you teach me and you pass on to the future generations. Any knowledge about this future Aba called Ismail. So they want to keep learning all the new things. This is the image. So now people, now of course Yaqub is not in Al-Hisab. We, we hope he's not. But the concept is the same. Even as Malaika, they come back to learn. So this concept of coming back to learn is not that strange. They're, they're all around us. And even our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for those of you who, who accept narrations, told us about, you know, 
نزلت عليهم السكينة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them kind of call people from Jannah to come listen to the people who are doing the toiling. So this is a question, how can we teach when we are not, when we are students for life? Yes, you are students for life, but you are also capable of having conversations and teaching and doing the toiling. I think you yourself in the past have asked me, do they learn from us when we're doing toiling silently? The answer is yes, just like they're able to teach you and rearrange the belt and shroom. So keep doing the toiling. This is the concept that we keep talking about for over four years now. Alhamdulillah, all of these concepts are confirming the same thing. So let's go back to Siyam. Siyam are this group of people who are thirsty, fasting, and they're desperate. And it's really hot for them. It's, it's anxious time for them. They want to get out of that situation into the Jannat. So Siyam in Ayat 2, 183 to 187 is a plural term, just like Qiyam, Kiram, Idam, Qiyam, not a singular infinitive noun, not a Masdar. It refers to a specific subset of Amphus or Nufus. Nufus is a better word, who are held in suspension, awaiting their judgment after their death. Kutiba alaykum is used in several Ayat. I'm just summarizing what I've told you before. When we trace them, this is the interpretation delegated upon you for you to judge and or to correct them. So in the case of the murderer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that you have a way better than killing him, judge him, to pass on a way for him to re-correct himself. That's the concept of kutiba alaykum. It's a beautiful concept and the parallels are absolutely unmissable. You can't miss them. That's why I put in the thumbnail May Allah forgive us. How did we miss this for 1400 years? It is so stunningly parallel and similar. Almost word for word between the first set of ayat and the second set of ayat regarding Ramadan. So now you understand the ayat about Siyam. Really, are they talking about physical fasting? We'll see. Let's look at the next ayah. Let's continue just to make sure. Uh, yeah, we finished 183. We go to 184. I promise you will go a lot faster. But there are still a few, you know, advanced concepts. So be patient. Um, toiling alone cannot help the ancestors, but toiling is a very good beginning. You need to start. You need to be able, you need to be in a position to be able to provide the help in the first place. If you don't know better knowledge than your ancestors, you can't help. So the idea here is learn. Remember the ayah that says, وَمَنْ خَافَ مِنْ مُوسٍ جَنَفًا Whoever fears from a person leaving a heritage, some pollution or something wrong, go ahead and fix it. It's your job. It's your responsibility. So those Salafi, let me be very blunt, those Salafi who are teaching us and teaching all the Muslims, don't think for yourself. Don't ask. Don't investigate. Don't do, you know, uh, interpretation of Quran of your own. I say the Quran belies you. You don't know nothing. The Quran is requiring me to fix what we find that we have received through the tradition. So this is 183 that we just read. Now, uh, sorry, 182. 184, ayyaman ma'dudat. Remember, kutiba alaykum as-siyam. As-siyam, plural, have been delegated to you to pass judgment, etc., etc., Oh, the last part of the ayah is really critical. I'm sorry, I'm skipping up and down. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Perchance, perchance, you know, we remind you, perchance, you attain to be disciplined. You attain to be disciplined. And I put dot, dot, dot in here. I hope you see it. Dot, dot, dot. Why? Because this ayah, the sentence is broken across two ayat. Let's continue. Ayyaman ma'dudat, you are disciplined against. Ayyaman ma'dudat, well, what's ayyaman ma'dudat? Well, we saw it earlier, about an hour ago in the presentation, if you remember, when we talked about those who said, because in Surah Al Imran, if I remember 24 or something like that, uh, they said, we're not going to be affected by nar except a limited finite number of days 
their mentality based on conceit, based on arrogance, based on corruption of their aqidah is what's being referred in here. And this is almost an exclusive marking. It's, all, it's only mentioned in a third situation in the case of Hajj. We'll talk more about that, inshallah, when we talk about Hajj. But it's a very clear marking, ayyam and ma'dudat. So, tattaqoon la'allakum tattaqoon from ayah 183, the one right before this one. Perchance, you defend yourself against ayyam and ma'dudat. What does that mean? Those who claim that punishment in the afterlife is limited to a few ayyam, few days, you protect yourself. You are disciplined against them. Tattaqoonahum. You are disciplined against them. I hope it's really clear. So this is this is a descriptor of that group of people. Don't be like them. Don't be like them. What does that mean? Allah is reminding you, you have been delegated to help those in suspension. And it's not just a matter of days. It's a matter of milestones. It's a matter of number of sort of uh, badges they have to earn, number of competencies they have to complete. So you go ahead and help Asiyam. Help those in a state of fasting in suspension. I hope it's really clear. It's a very beautiful spiritual concept. And all of the linguistic structures confirm everything I'm saying. We continue. Whosoever among you is sick, man kana minkum maridan. Whosoever, uh, please focus on, on what I'm presenting and leave some of the other questions to later. I promise you we're going to deal with them. But there are lots of complex topics that I'm presenting. And I'm worried that you guys are missing some of them. So please continue. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ This is, well, how do you get away from that one, Dr. Hani? This is clearly talking about sickness. Yeah, but in some ayat of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a group of people. He said, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ in their cores is sickness. So Allah increased them in sickness. Increase them in sickness. So in other words, someone who's described to be sick is not necessarily just physically sick. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those in whose core there is sickness. Is it possible that this ayah is talking about that? Yeah, investigate it for yourself. And see all the different forms of the root marad, and you will reach a conclusion as we did. Sickness in their core. Well, what about safar, traveling? The word safar is never used in the Quran to mean that way. Safar, an older corrupted tom. The plural is asfar, which is also used in the Quran in, uh, let's see, in um, in various ayat, especially in the scripture of, uh, relationship to the scripture of Musa. I think in Surah uh, Saba. So as far is used, that's a plural. Singular is an older corrupted tomb. Well, what does that mean? Whoever among you has this type of sickness in their core or is insisting on remaining upon the old safar, because the Quran is not referred to as safar, Notice here that uh, I put this, you know, I need to help you a little bit see better. So let me do this. Yeah, that's better. Um, so, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ This is the key part. So whoever among you is sick, or afflict, meaning afflicted with sickness in their core, or is upon a safar, meaning they insist on remaining on the old system. Then imposed upon them is a number, idda. Remember, idda only means number. Idda is a number. To make up. To make up. That's something I'm adding because that's part of the structure. To make up. And they are but... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is say, saying these people, marid or ala safar, remember, marid doesn't mean sick as we understand it. Marid in the language of the Quran is referring to sickness of the heart. <clears throat> Whoever is uh, that type of sick or ala safar upon that old tomb. By the way, safar is not usually referred to 
the kitab. Safar is referring to something they wrote. So you're insisting on staying on your man-made written quote unquote scriptures. So you are you are required to do idda. You are idda. You you are required to do the idda. And you are from ayam, from those same ayam, from the same ayam I just talked about. But you are others like them. Ukhar. So you are others like the above ayam. That's what it's saying. Now we continue. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ And upon those who cannot bear it. Pay attention. عَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ In the past I've given a, an interpretation I think in 2022 if I'm not mistaken. And this is this could be understood as an alternative, a supplemental, whatever you want. So who cannot bear it or enable someone else to do what's next. You're going to see. So who is Damir Al-Qadim? You know, something coming later. Who cannot bear it or cannot enable someone to do what's next. Food. Ta'am. I want to stop here. Do you see the word ta'am or it'am? Those of you who know how to read Arabic, please answer me. Ta'am or it'am? The answer is ta'am, food. You go down. I'm going to show you. So you see it for yourself. Every single interpretation and tafsir and translation said it's feeding. It'am, as if they read it'am. It'am would be like that. Would be... Oops. It'am. There's there's alif hamza below it before the word. But in the Quran, there is no this this alif hamza is not there. This alif, alif hamza is not there. It's ta'am, the food itself. Oh, what's the difference, Dr. Hani? You know, you're making a big deal out of out of little things. Well, it's not a big thing, big deal out of little things. It's really a big deal because it is not the Quran is not ta talking about the Quran is not talking about. Uh, you making a compensation by feeding another person. The Quran is talking about those who cannot tolerate it uh, and cannot bear it and cannot do what's next because we're going to see what's next. What's next is ta'amu miskin, the food of a miskin. We're going to see what miskin is. The food of miskin. So, what is the fidya meaning the food? Well, it means you cook. No, it means you buy. No, that's not what it says. It says you have to provide the food that they're looking for. The miskin is looking for. Well, what is a miskin? The miskin is someone who is desperate to find tranquility. In in the Abrahamic locution, that means the learning of the proper learning the proper understanding, even if that someone is in the state of Siam in his afterlife. So, are there people who are seeking sakina? Seeking this tranquility in the afterlife, especially the Siyam, as Siyam, all of them. They're looking for this Sakina. I told you the very definition of being in that state of suspension is this anxiety, this anxiousness that they're suffering. So they want Sakina. So Allah is referring to them as Sakina. So what do you have to offer them? Ta'am, the sustenance. Well, how do you offer sustenance to someone? in suspension after their death this is what we're talking about you should you should seek to learn what we're talking about in here which is to learn how to toil and to converse about it and to present it within your family members and to discuss it in in a way that they understand all of that that's their ta'am that's what they can consume it's not talking about miskin in the sense of some a uh, poor person walking on the street. That's required, by the way, in many other ayat. Not this ayat. This is not what it's talking about. It's not talking about feeding the poor. This ayat is not talking about it'am. And by the way, there's another evidence that I need to share with you. I looked at all of the tira'at, the multiple readings, the multiple readings of the Quran. So I said, now, am I imagining this? And it says 
in some other qiraat, and by the way, the, the, the references are here. Those of you who get the notes will get to see them. They're very clear. In some of the qiraat, very many actually, not just one or two, many. This ayah should be read, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مسكين. Multiple ones. How many? It doesn't say. So that destroys the whole concept of fidya, you know, compensation for something uh, uh, that, that you did, which is you can't tolerate, you can't bear the fasting. That's what they taught us. So this part of the ayah is not talking about bearing the fasting, the physical fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us those who cannot, those who cannot do what's required to the siyam, which is to teach them, they have um, those who can bear it, those who can cannot bear it, or those who can enable someone else to do it, they have they have to do fidya. Fidya for whom? Fidya for the people in Siyam. Because usually, usually you pay the fidya, you give the fidya for the prisoner of war. You don't pay a fidya for yourself. If you're a prisoner of war, somebody else has to pay your fidya. So fidya, by definition, it's a compensation that the person who is locked in or locked up cannot make. So those who cannot bear it can have others provide this fidya, this compensation. I hope it's really clear. Ta'amu miskin. So this is the, the, the type of, of understanding, knowledge, that would allow us siyam to no longer be in a state of siyam. In other words, they have earned one more thing they have to check before they pass on from al-hisab into a better state. Now, back to us. فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ فَخَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Whoever volunteers to teach or enable someone else, the good understanding, then this shall constitute a better understanding of Allah's command for him. What's going on here? Whoever volunteers to teach or enable someone else to teach good understanding, meaning even if you don't have any relatives, let's say, just by miracle, you don't have any relatives in Hisab, you volunteer, you start putting out any kind of effort to help others. This is a better understanding of Allah's command for him, for that person. Now, remember here we started in the ayah before, kutiba alaykum, kutiba alaykum, as kutiba alaykum as Let's continue. At the end of the next ayah, this ayah 184, it continues with the letter wow, wa an tasumu khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. There are at least two different ways to understand this linguistically. I'm talking linguistically. First one, also delegated upon you is, is that not to fast. Remember, and tasumu and followed by mudari' sometimes can be understood so that not, so that you don't fast. So Allah is telling us, telling us, your not fasting is better for you. If, if you are if you have evidence-based knowledge, makes perfect sense. If you have better, if you have evidence-based knowledge, it's better for you. It's more good understanding for you to not go through the period of hisab among asiyam. I hope you understand. So you don't have to fast in the afterlife. Makes sense. And tasub. What else? Also delegated upon you that not to fast in the afterlife, yes, we just said it, but also that not to fast is better for you if you have evidence-based knowledge. Well, to fast, actually. Um, so, an tasumu is like kutiba alaykum. So, kutiba alaykum, an tasumu, that you fast, is better for you if you have evidence-based knowledge. When? During this life. That's why at the very beginning, in the conclusion, let me repeat it so everybody is clear. So, because I, I, I messed it up a little bit. So, an tasumu, if it is understood to mean so that you don't, it would be understood for the afterlife. 
for you not to fast in the afterlife, meaning not to go to the hisab at all. You go through bighayri hisab. And there are many people mentioned that way. So you don't fast in the afterlife. It's better for you if, if you have evidence-based knowledge. So in other words, this is an encouragement to go seek evidence-based knowledge because that's one way to bypass hisab. Number one. Number two, if you have evidence-based knowledge, it's better for you to fast in this life. This is also included in this meaning. This is why I feel very confident for myself, not for anyone else, for myself, that we are required to do physical fasting in this life. I hope it's really clear. So you don't agree, don't agree. I don't, I don't mind at all. But my advice is that the Arabic strongly support it. For whom? There's a condition in here. In kuntum ta'lamu. If you are, uh, if you have evidence-based knowledge. So if you've been learning, if you've been acquiring any kind of knowledge, in my opinion, any kind of knowledge, evidence-based knowledge, real evidence-based knowledge, not rote memorization, but any kind of real evidence-based knowledge, even you're an engineer, yes. You're educated in any field, yes. That's evidence-based knowledge. Because modern day knowledge includes evidence-based knowledge, period. Of course, not the type that they teach to some mullahs and imams where it is just memorized without thinking, without questioning. Evidence-based knowledge is all types of knowledge. I, are we required to do siyam in this life? The answer is yes. Kutib alaykum. You are, you are delegated to do that. There is, there is clear linguistic evidence for doing that. Okay, let's keep moving. So because of the time, as I said, this is a reference for the source of the Qira'at. And here you can see that um, masakin, masakin, not just miskin, plural, is used in some Qira'at. This is um, when, when we talked about ta'am miskin, I just wanted to include for your reference that all the translations got it wrong and they refer to feeding a poor person even though the words are ta'am, the food itself. Your obligation is to pay, to put forward as a ransom. Ransom for whom? For the person who is locked up. Locked up where? In suspension, in al-hisab. So someone is in prison and you are bringing fidya, fidya, compensation, ransom. So you can do that. What is that? Ta'am. Ta'am for someone seeking tranquility. Every book of tef translation based on the books of tafsir got it wrong. Here's Sahih International. Here's Pikthal feeding. Here's Yusuf Ali feeding. Here's Shakir, Shakir uh, feeding. Here's Muhammad Sarwar, Muhsin Khan feeding. Uh, here's Arbery feeding. It doesn't say feeding. It am. It says ta'am. Ta'am. Even Muhammad Asad feeding. Sam Gerens feeding. Uh, Abdul Halim, the Oxford feeding. All wrong. All, they got it wrong. They already had a mental image before the translation started. And they applied their mental image to the Quran instead of the other way around. The Quran is saying ta'am. You're, you're providing food. Well, food as a fidya, that means you're paying ransom for someone who's locked up. That's what it means. So I hope you see the spiritual concepts already building up. Let's continue now. Ayah 185. <coughs> we have two more ayah after that. So we continue. Remember, in kuntum ta'lamun is the last clause from the prior ayah. If you have evidence-based knowledge. Ta'lamun is a verb that accepts either being transitive or intransitive. So if you stop the ayah there, in kuntum ta'lamun, it's intransitive. You just have evidence-based knowledge, and that's acceptable. But if you view, if you understand the word or the verb ta'lamun as a transitive verb, it requires an object. Maf'ul, maf'ul bihi. So in that case, the next ayah could provide that. But wait, wait, wait. Shahru is marfu' it has a dhamma on it. Yeah, but in a large number of qira'at, it's read shahra, shahra Ramadan. In kuntum ta'lamun, shahra Ramadan. 
So Shahra in this ayah could very well play the role of maf'ul bihi for ta'lamun, the ayah before. I know some of you are going to miss this, but for those of you who are uh, advanced in Arabic or are going to question my abilities to read and understand, this is the background. And just to continue this, if you go to the next page, you see that I give you the references where um, Mujahid and Shahar ibn Hausha ibn Harun al-Awar, Abi Amr, Abu Amara, An Afs, An Hasim, An Asim, An Hafs, An Asim, Wal Hassan, Muawiyah, Wal Hassan, Wazaid, etc., etc. Shahra bin Nasib, Shahra Ramadan, not just Shahru. So it's an acceptable qira'a. It's a very, very legitimate way to understand it the way I'm presenting it. And here's what I'm doing to present it. So continuing from the previous ayah, if you have evidence-based knowledge about that declaration of Ramadan, now this changes the meaning totally. Because if you're reading it, Shahra Ramadan, in Kuntum Ta'lamun, Shahra Ramadan, Shahr is not just a month, it's a declaration. And this is what I've been saying since four years ago. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing this possibility, the declaration about Ramadan. Well, what's Ramadan? Now, as I said at the very beginning of this presentation, Ramadan is a term that is derived from the root Ramadah, Ramadah, excessive heat, excessive thirst at the end of a period of drought. It's very legitimate way to use it after an extended drought. Okay, so Ramadan is describing ism fa'il, ism fa'il. So someone who is suffering that condition, excessive heat, excessive thirst after an extended drought. Does that make sense? Does that remind you of anyone? Yeah, that, that, the type of siyam that we're talking about. So Allah is referring to them using this concept. So what is the concept? The concept is, I just shared with you a very important thing about hisab. Remember we saw earlier, for you to learn through the Quran about the concept of hisab. These ayat are teaching us about al-hisab. Those who are going through al-hisab are referred to in the earlier ayat as as-siyam, as-siyam, kutiba alaykum, as-siyam, upon you are delegated for you to judge them and to help them and to correct them and so on and so forth. So here, the declaration of the same people referred to collectively as Ramadan, Ramadan, those who are excessively thirsty after an extended drought. Now, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ For which the Quran has been made accessible to clarify. Well, where do you get that from? In Arabic, in Arabic, we read very often, uh, Aisha said, Unzila fiya al Quran. Unzila fiya al Quran. Quran was revealed about me, or part of the Quran was revealed about me. The very common expression. We see it all over the early, early part of the tradition. So, Unzila fi means it's revealed about or it discusses that topic. So, the Quran, Unzila fihi. Fi Shahr Ramadan, Fi Declaration of Ramadan. Yeah, the Quran was revealed partly for which, for 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 what, for uh, clarifying the concept of the Declaration of Ramadan. Well, what's the Declaration of Ramadan? What I just talked about, how we are delegated, just like those before us, we are delegated to judge and to correct Asliyam. Those who are suffering, fasting, in their stage of being in suspended state. I hope it's really clear. And the ayat I shared with you about al-hisab, لِتَعْلَمُوا عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ وَالْحِسَاب confirms that this is unzila fihi. It's revealed about that. The Quran is hudan linnas وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ The Quran has guidance for people, mankind, people specifically, for Bani Israel, because it's referring to the book of Musa, the scripture of Musa, and also Bayinatim min al Huda, and it has instruments of deduction, instruments of extracting evidence from the guidance, from the Torah. So, parts of what we read is actually from the Torah, 
and to clarify the application of the criterion for distinguishing between various categories mentioned in this paragraph. What categories? Well, a CM are to be judged. Some of them are to be corrected. Some of them are not to be corrected because they don't stand a chance of learning and they are repeat offenders. And you know what I'm talking about. So we're going to see in the story of Suleiman with the woman, she's a repeat offender. And we're going to see how she has no hope. And we are to be the judges. And you're going to see for yourself. So Allah presents the evidence. And we're going to be the judges. What about other possible similar situation? Karins maybe? Are we the judges? We're going to see. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ And thus, pay attention because it's really critical. Whoever witnesses, witnesses, observes, that's the meaning, شهد, شهد, observes the declaration describes above. Let him fast it. There's no other way to avoid this. فَلْيَصُمْهُ That means fast. There's no other way to play around with the words in here. فَلْيَصُمْهُ So what are we saying? Whoever witnesses, observes, that's why I said there are two categories, two categories of people. A group of Muhammad and his early companions who witnessed the revelation of this declaration regarding as and us as we understand it today. Oh, Dr. Haney, why did you do this to us? It doesn't matter because you qualify under other condition, which is... <laughs> uh, you have evidence-based knowledge already. So, siyam is a requirement upon in kuntum ta'lamun. And also, if you witnessed, meaning observed, meaning learned about this declaration. Very clear. This is my recommendation. This is my conclusion. This is what I feel comfortable facing Allah with. This is, this is the only thing I can say no playing games with this. We go with what we are taught, with, with what we are given evidence for. Let's continue. Um, no, it does not say it was revealed in a month. This is not about a month. This is talking about a declaration. And I think you missed what I said in here. Um, but anyway, we'll, you'll get to watch it again. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Whoever witnesses. By the way, just a quick word. شَهِدَ as a verb can be used in two different ways. Can be used in two different ways. شَهِدَ being the witness, the one who does the observation, meaning you are present during the event. And as I said, this applies to the time of Muhammad and his companions. And شَهِدَ means to testify later as in court or as in an investigation to testify. That's a witness. So which shahida is here? I hope you understand the difference between the two. First shahida is he observed. He was there during the event. The second shahida is he was a witness about a certain fact or information later on. Which shahida in here? The answer is both. We cannot say either this or that exclusively. Both. So we are testifying to understand what's going on. We are testimony type of witness. The people during the time of Muhammad, they were observing type of witness. Both are required. It applies to all of us. And because we are from Qawmun in Kuntum Ta'lamun, we are also required. Now, this one, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ you could, you could interpret it as sick in the traditional way, or you can interpret it as I interpreted earlier, sickness in their core. Both are legitimate in here. And we can continue with the same interpretation. Then those people who are sick in their core are like the other ayam that we saw above. So Allah is confirming this is part of the new, new way that I'm instructing you through the Quran. That means... Don't go thinking it's a limited number of days in the afterlife. It's not a limited number of days. The concept of CM still applies to you. The concept of CM, it's called now, <coughs> excuse me, now it's called Shahru Ramadan, the declaration of the super thirsty at the end of an extended drought period.
Now, is Dr. Hani imagining this? Is this something that the Quran is instructing us today? The answer is yes. Because here, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ This is talking about present tense. That means as far as the Quran is concerned at the time of revelation for the present and the future. Allah intends for you ease of cognition. For you? No. Through you. Through you. Bikum. Ah, this confirms everything I've said so far. So fasting, physical fasting, is required. And we've seen ta'amu miskin, feeding, and being voluntarily uh, willing to do that. All of that stuff we've seen. So everything we've learned in the tradition about Ramadan, studying the Quran studiously, studiously, not just rote, rote memorization or rote uh, you know, recitation without understanding. That's not acceptable. But really studying it, understanding it, and uh, the act of, of fasting as an act of devotion, all here. What else? Allah wants through you, through you, become this ba in here is called ba al wasila, the ba of the instrument. So you are the instrument for what? For ease of cognition. Ease of cognition to whom? Ah, you guessed it. To Asiyam, your ancestors, your ancestors who are begging, who are thirsty, who are crying with, with hopelessness, they did not learn and they're not ready to go to Firdaus. We need, they need someone to come give them ta'amu miskin. It's really a sad situation that for 1400 years we never understood these concepts. So, why are we required to do the physical fasting? To feel them, to remember what they're going through. Yeah, it's physical for us, but it's the same mentality. Just imagine fasting for 24 hours without water, without food. Okay, try it for two days. Try it for three days. Can you sustain it? If you cannot sustain 24 hours, how will you be willing to sustain a Yemen Madudat in that state? That's all part of the spiritual understanding of fasting physically in Ramadan. So there are spiritual dimensions that are revealed in this ayat that are absolutely stunning. But the most important, perhaps, the most important benefit and value is for you to remember your ancestors who might be today in a fasting state. In Siyam, among Siyam. I hope you understand and you appreciate so here Allah is telling us, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ Through you, He wants to provide the ease of cognition to them, to those in Siyam, the plural. وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرَ <clears throat> And He does not intend for you the hardship. What hardship? To go through that Siyam. So help those who are currently in hardship by providing them ease of cognition. Why me, Dr. Haney? Because you are the most qualified to teach your aunt. You are the most qualified to teach your father if, la samahallah, your father or your aunt are in Hisab right now. You're the closest to them. He's not going to bring somebody from, you know, the Mau Mau Islands to teach your father if your father is, is born in Saudi Arabia or wherever. And you get the picture. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kutiba alaykum delegated to you. This is the whole concept. And he does not want the hardship. And for you, by the way, he wants for you to complete the quantity. <clears throat> for you to complete the quantity. What quantity? al In this life. Ah, so the fasting is not about idda. It's about, idda is about how we can learn certain number of concepts and pass on a certain number of concepts with ease of cognition. That's idda. Yes, it is. Right there. Wali tukmilu al-idda. I hope you got it. Because I'm going to keep going. Wali tukabbiru Allah ala mahadakum. So that you declare Allah's guidance to be superior in recognition for that to which he has guided you. In other words, Allah is guiding us, inshallah, all of us on this channel watching and all of those who will be watching in the future. Allah is guiding us. In recognition of that, what do we have to 
give back, we declare, and we've seen this before. We've declared, we've declared that Allah is the source of all superior knowledge, the only source of superior knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects this declaration from us. This is the declaration. He is the one, the source of knowledge, superior knowledge, in recognition for that to which he has guided you. Is this part of the reason of fasting? Yes, it is. And perchance you are communicating with Allah. All of those concepts are wrapped up <clears throat> in the concept of fasting and uh, the concept of uh, teaching or providing food for miskeen who are among asiyam. And all of that stuff is Shahru Ramadan, the declaration of Ramadan. Siyam is, is uh, Siyam are learning, yes. And they have the potential and the desire and the desperate situation to learn. Not eating or drinking physical, of course. But Siyam is also used. This verb in here, فَلْيَصُمْهُ can only be interpreted, can only be interpreted in the present tense to mean abstaining from food and drink. We cannot, we cannot interpret it uh, to, to mean metaphorically uh, unless you play all sorts of acrobatics, to be honest with you, and I, I don't, I don't find it palatable. So I can tell you, man shahida minkum shahra, whoever witnesses or testifies to this declaration and doesn't want to admit it, let him be among a siyam. Okay, but that's an acrobatic. This is talking about us. This is talking about us in this life. No, no other way to interpret it. So anyway, this is, I'm going to keep going because we still have, uh, oh my God, four pages. Let's see. This one is really cool, but I think it will offend a lot of people. So I, 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 I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll include it in a, future, uh, in a future segment. Let me go to the conclusion so we can wrap up. Uh, conclusions that I'm comfortable sharing and we're going to wrap up. <clears throat> Uh, there is no abrogation in any of the ayat in this paragraph that we just saw. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> they are all consistent and coherent, and they describe a transition from the old Torah system to the new Quran system, which introduces a learning, sorry, a lessening of burden, as well as empowerment to the muttaqun, as well as an additional requirement to the muttaqun as we just saw in kuntum ta'lamun if you are among those who have evidence based knowledge so the question then becomes what about the physical fasting the real spiritual practice relates to experiencing physical siyam their condition the condition of the physical uh, sorry the condition of the siyam those in that state we experience it physically and remember them. So they taught us, you know, you, you remember the condition of the poor or your condition. Yeah, but there's something much more serious, which is the condition of those who are siyam, plural, with the hope of remembering those suffering siyam in their afterlife and never experience it, that condition, in your afterlife. But there is no earthly punishment for missing the physical fasting practice. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to do it. But I looked as hard as I could and there's no, there's no punishment. There's no earthly punishment. So is that going to become part of the idda? Especially if, you, especially if you rationalize to yourself to be liar, you make that judgment. For those who witness the declaration, us as well, meaning Sa'a number two and Sa'a number one, it is likely mandatory. This is my recommendation, my conclusion, the part that I'm comfortable sharing with you and hopefully you will do your own uh, research and, and decision. I can talk about Taraweeh a little bit, but let me summarize because it's really getting late. As it's currently practiced, there's no agreement on its details. Let's put this in the front. No two countries in the world, no two masjids in the world agree on the details of how to do taraweeh today. And we all know that. 
there are some general guidelines, but really, even in prayer, salat, they don't agree. As it is practiced today, our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not practice it. And he discouraged his followers when he saw them do it. Omar, Omar ibn Khattab, is the endorser for the public to practice the current practice. And we all know it. We covered it in YT-172 and I think YT-171. Our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practiced night salat regularly. Sought salat at night. Salat al-layl. But his salat, even in his form of salat, was fully tadabbur. As he was reading, our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was thinking and reflecting and linking all of these ayat together. So that's how he did tadabbur. That's how the early Muslims did tadabbur by reviewing, by reviewing the Quran from memory and listening to it as it's being recited. They did not have computers and books and databases and research, research tools and that kind of thing. That was their tadabbur, the only option they had. Now let's talk about the word tarawih. It's from the root rawaha, rawaha or rawh. This is in the Quran. So we find in Surah Yusuf, وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Don't despair of Allah. Unbounded sucker. Unbounded sucker, rawh. It also means something else we're going to see. Also in Surah 34, 12. So don't despair of Allah's unbounded sucker, of course. But for Sulaiman, in this ayah, 34, 12, for Sulaiman, الريح, the triumphs, the triumphant ones, their morning journey, journey brought a declaration. Shahrun, and their evening journey brought a declaration. Brought a declaration, brought back a declaration. So in the morning they leave, in the evening they come back. <coughs> so every time they go and every time they come back, there is a declaration being shared. Shahr. So we saw... Uh, وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا 30 declarations. I told you at that time. I'll leave it till later. I'll describe it later. 30 declarations. This is what it's talking about. So rawah is a word used. That's a connection with the malaika. The connection with the malaika is referred to as taraweeh, but not in the current form for most Muslims. For the vast majority of Muslims today who don't understand a word they're hearing, it means nothing to the malaika. They're not connecting with the malaika by uttering words they don't understand. I hope you understand. Maybe their relatives or maybe their uh, their siyam from their families are enjoying listening to the Quran. Maybe we don't have evidence for that. But just listening to the Quran is not sufficient, as we as we've said many many times before. So toiling on the Quran, ta'amu miskin, something that feeds them. What is it that feeds them? When they are in a state of siyam, understanding. Khair. فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا It's the khair, the understanding that, that matters. So if you remember when Musa was in trouble and he was escaping from Masr, he ran away from Masr. He said, رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فقير. I don't know how to apply what I know. He knew a lot of scripture from his mother's house, etc., etc., but he was running away because he got himself in trouble. So his dua, Musa's dua was, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. Give me the understanding so I apply it correctly. So I don't keep getting myself in trouble. That's khair, understanding, the right application. So, فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Whoever volunteers this type of khair, it's better for that person and you receive more. And we saw at the very beginning, Ayah 180, if I remember, in Taraka Khairan Al Wasiya. If you leave some Khair behind, leave some recommendation. Recommendation for whom? For the parents and the relatives. So all of those concepts are coming together. They're very stunning, very beautiful. The understanding of the spiritual dimensions of this are beyond, beyond description, to be honest with you. So I hope you will comment and give us some feedback if you are connecting with this. And finally, for those of you who want to see the narration, otherwise they don't believe anything I'm saying, also our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is supposed to have said through the mouth of Omar, Omar is a rawi 
and this is in at tirmidhi ibn Maja, Ahmad, etc., etc., sahih. لو أنكم تتوكلون على الله حق توكله لرزقكم كما يرزق الطير. Supposedly he said about Muhammad, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم saying if you were to uh, take Allah as an arbiter the way Allah should be taken as an arbiter then he would give you sustenance, spiritual, intellectual, etc. Just like he gives sustenance to Attair, Attair in the Abrahamic locution, angels, Malaika. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Attair and gives you, okay? And now the description fits what we saw in here about Sulaiman. They 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 leave in the morning, Taghdu Khimasan. In the morning they leave and they're hungry and they come back, Taruhu, they come back, Bitanan, their stomachs full, meaning. They're filled with the food they were seeking. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you take Allah as the arbiter, that will be the same for you as it is for the malaika. They're learning from you. You're learning from them. That's what it's saying. And this is what this ayah is also saying, 3412. So as you see, we have a complete set of concepts that really complement each other. I know we have we've been going on for two hours and 40 minutes. But um, so at the very end, I'm still shocked by some basic questions. Uh, I I'm not going to take on a lot of these questions, to be honest with you. I advise you to watch again from the very beginning, pay attention, put uh, pen to paper and take some notes. And hopefully you will benefit. Um, you will benefit, inshallah, and you will uh, give us some feedback. I would highly encourage all of you to watch it more than once there's a lot of information in here and there's a lot of details i'm also going to include in the notes the last ayah which i did not translate for you live but i included it um in in the notes so i will leave it as a gift for those who receive the notes through the website i encourage you to subscribe to our website if you have not done so we could use your support also if you subscribe to this channel would really greatly appreciate it. Uh, we are looking for your opinion, your ideas, your questions through the comment stream. I review them. Inshallah, I'll be able to answer them. I hope this was uh, reasonably long, but you have a long week ahead of you. So inshallah, you'll get to watch it. And inshallah, you'll get to learn a lot from it. And hopefully you'll teach me a, a thing or two. If I made some mistakes, please don't hesitate to share. Let's make the dua together. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هذان الله لقد جاءت رسول ربنا بالحق Thank you so very much for watching. Salamun alaykum.